Hey everyone, let me tell you a story. I once had a dream that my friend Singly6 uploaded a massive three hour retrospective of every Jurassic Park video game ever made to his YouTube channel. When I told him the next morning he said, well I have to do it now. He never did. But I couldn't get the idea out of my head, and if you clicked on this video, well, you already know the result. This video took way too long to make. Like, subscribe, comment, share it around, I'd really appreciate it. Anyway, here's a retrospective of almost every Jurassic Park game ever made. That's the video. <laughs> There's over 40 of them. And this video is only about the first 12. It's gonna take a while. There's a chapter select if you want to watch the video in chunks and a bibliography in the description below. Hold on to your butts. It all starts, appropriately enough, with a T-Rex. We all know why we're here and the game knows it too. The 8-bit T-Rex head rising out of the gloom to vomit the main menu onto the screen is a surprisingly atmospheric start. It sets expectations high. Expectations that are shattered the second you hit the start button. Jurassic Park for the Nintendo Entertainment System, like the island's main attractions, is a beast from a bygone age, a frustrating disaster of a top-down shooter where you guide Alan Grant across six relatively short but inarguably tedious levels in an attempt to escape Jurassic Park. But while your goal as the player is to escape, the game's goal is to waste your time, as much as it can in as many ways as it can imagine. The level design is hyper-focused on drawing out each playthrough for as long as it possibly can in order to give the insane difficulty all the time it needs to grind you down until you game over. Take this level where you have to navigate a maze to turn on these terminals in a specific order while under attack from constantly respawning dinosaurs. Or this level where you have to navigate the guts of a ship in a bullet hell maze of lightning bolts, electric floor panels and constantly respawning dinosaurs. Or this level where you have to avoid getting crushed by stampeding triceratopses despite moving at half their speed. Or take any level where the game forces you to collect every single dinosaur egg in order to unlock a keycard to progress. Which is all of them. Eggs. If I had to sum up this game in a word, it would be eggs. Eggs on the ground, eggs on the roof. Eggs hidden inside baffling level geometry. Eggs hidden behind baffling level geometry. Collect them, shoot them, love them. I was shocked at how much of this game is spent just collecting big blue dinosaur eggs. Though the game lists only six levels, each one is made up of multiple indoor and outdoor areas and all but a handful have eggs for you to collect. There is just no getting around it. This game is eggs. I'll admit, there was something satisfying about collecting them all, but it's the same sort of anemic satisfaction that comes from grinding. Watching the egg counter click down by one until it vanished in each area was what netted me the tiny shots of dopamine. The actual process of searching them out was nothing but more mindless busy work. At least until the last level of the game where the egg hunt suddenly becomes actively difficult. The last area you travel through before the final boss is the famous raptor cage from the film. There are only three eggs to find, and the area is small, but the developers thought it would be funny if they hid them all behind opaque foreground objects. Not only is moving behind the trees like trying to navigate a maze blindfolded, but the edges of the bushes serve as spawn points for enemy dinosaurs, meaning you can stumble right into them and die without ever knowing they were there. And just to add insult to injury, there are explosive boxes that kill you instantly hidden in there with the eggs too. This game is hard, this game is cruel, this game is not afraid to fight dirty, but neither am I. With the benefit of my very real Nintendo Entertainment System, I was able to bypass or at least lessen most of the game's bullshit, and I still found it to be an exercise in frustration. It was, at least, a short exercise though. It took me just under two hours to complete from start to finish, but that was with the benefit of save states. If I was suddenly transported back to 1993 and forced to play the game as it was intended, I could easily imagine it taking so much longer. Days even. As was common for the time, there's no inbuilt save system. Each time you sit down to play, you do it from the very beginning. You start the game with four continues, each with three lives. The lives are largely meaningless. You don't lose your weapons, you don't lose your score, and Grant just pops right back up where he fell with some invincibility frames to keep you going if any dinosaurs happen to be camping your body. It's the continues that matter. Lose a continue and you're sent back to the beginning of the level with your score reset. Lose all four continues and that's it game over. You will have to start the game again. The number of continues you have is fixed, but it is possible to get extra lives, even if it is very difficult. There are two methods. The first is to score a thousand points in a single continue, which, when eggs only increase it by five and raptors by fifteen, takes a while. You really have to be good at the game if you want to rely on score for extra lives, and if you are that good you probably don't need to in the first place. The other method is to test your bravery at the box of mystery. The game is littered with these mystery boxes bearing an enticing question mark. Some give you extra lives. Some give Give you extra health. Some give you a few seconds of invincibility. Some just kill you, but most just explode in your face and take away health. Will you take your chances? 
These things are all over the game. They're almost as common as the eggs. The game even throws them at you in bunches of two or three like it's playing a game of free card Monty, just daring you to pick one. There's nothing to tell you which ones will help and which ones don't. They all share the same sprite. Their position sometimes gives it away. If a box is close to something important, like an egg or in a tight interior space, it's a safe bet that it's going to hurt you in some way. Likewise, if they're hidden behind trees or bushes, they're probably helpful, but not always. I hate these boxes. I wouldn't be surprised if most people who played this game back at release learned to ignore them rather than risk death. And if I'd played the game without the benefit of save states, I wouldn't have touched them with a 10-foot pole. But given I did, I decided to check each and every one of them I could find. Most of them just exploded in my face or killed me outright. Like everything else in this game, they are just there to waste your time. But to its credit, the game doesn't leave you completely defenseless against its bullshit. There are four weapons with which to repel the many, many dinosaurs that are constantly trying to turn Grant into dinner. There's your standard yellow gun. It's the weakest of the four, taking five shots to drop raptors and even two to kill the little swarming compies. But it's also the only one with a constant supply of ammunition. Defeated dinosaurs drop the same amount of ammo that they took to kill, so if you make a habit of picking up the ammo drops, you'll never run out. Next is the green gun. It's more powerful than the yellow gun, needing only two shots to kill a raptor instead of five, but otherwise it's functionally the same. The blue gun was easily my favourite, a one-hit kill rocket that shoots through every dinosaur on its journey to the edge of the screen. It's a great crowd clearer. I was always happy to see it. And finally, there's the red gun, which, while not my favourite, is objectively the best gun in the game. It fires free spinning bullets that do massive damage to everything they hit. The way they spin means they can usually hit the constantly moving dinosaurs with better accuracy than the other free guns that all fire in a straight line too. And that's a good thing because aiming in this game sucks. For one simple reason too. The bullets aren't centered to Grant's character model. Instead they're aligned to the gun in Grant's hands. Great verisimilitude, especially for the time, but very frustrating when trying to kill dinosaurs rushing in to eat your face. Lining up a shot with most of the weapons requires standing slightly off to the side of any given dinosaur. Otherwise it's just wasted ammo sailing past wafer fin unforgiving hitboxes. It's something you get used to over time, but it never quite goes away. When you have time to prepare your shots it's not a huge problem once you learn to account for it, but when the raptors are closing in or the T-Rex is charging up to take a bite it's another thing entirely. And the raptors are always closing in. It's rare to see a moment of this game without any dinosaurs on screen, given they are constantly spawning in from anywhere they can. Behind trees, behind walls, from off screen, from the water. You are under constant attack. I especially like this raptor that spawns in after you turn the power back on. A nice little movie moment there. The spawns are constant, but they're at least reliable. The dinosaurs always appear from the same spot every time you pass them, but with the insane amount of backtracking in this game, that means you're going to be passing them a lot. Fleeing backward to kill a raptor and then retracing your steps forward can trap you in a cycle of having to fight the same dinosaur over and over again. You can clear the screen if you try hard enough, but for most of the game, if you stop moving, even for a moment, it's a death sentence. The only way to stay alive is to keep moving. Moving, which is a problem when Grant moves at the speed of a snail. Well, that's not quite true. Moving up and down or left and right is slow, but his speed doubles on the diagonals. The compies are slow when the Dilophosaurs don't move, but the raptors share Grant's movement speed, meaning zooming along the diagonals is the only way for the player to create some distance in order to line up a shot. I have no idea if this was intentional, but I'm not complaining. Look at him go! Of course, this quirk of the movement mechanics also applies to the dinosaurs. It doesn't really affect the compies, but it definitely affects the raptors. If one spawns facing a diagonal, it can shoot out from the trees and kill Grant before the player can even react. It's wild. These are all things you can work around in the big outdoor areas, but the interiors are another matter. Grant's hitbox is so big that it's almost impossible to move around these spaces, especially with dinosaurs constantly on your tail. Passages of the character model is small enough to fit through, but the hitbox isn't can spell your doom if you get stuck on them. And this includes the doorways that separate the rooms. At least the raptors get stuck on them too. They can't actually pass through the doors like the smaller compies can, but they are more than happy to camp the doorways if they're already aggroed, which, if you're already under attack, means shooting your way out or risking a dash through the door while the raptor is hidden behind the wall. And with Grant Box hitbox Grant box. And with Grant's hitbox being what it is, you're probably going to get hit. As for the story, well what story? There is an assumption on the game's part that the person playing it already has the context for what's going on, either from having seen the movie or read the manual. Instead, the game adapts story beats, save Lex and Tim from the T-Rex, turn the power on, contact the mainland and call for help, find and destroy some hidden raptor nests on top of a giant underground rave. You know, all the best moments from the movie. There's even one or two from the book, like this short section where you travel up a river by raft or board a ship infested with raptors. You're never told why the dinosaurs escaped or how. You're never given any indication that there's anyone else on the island aside from you, Lex and Tim at all. It's like the film drawn out in nightmarish abstract. 
But then how do you adapt something like the first iconic T-Rex attack in a game like this? Or the rising tension of Ellie Sattler turning the power back on juxtaposed with Brand and the kids climbing an electric fence? How do you live up to the raptor attack that serves as the film's climax, or the book's climax? The game knows it can't, so it doesn't try. Instead it aims for atmosphere, and you know what? Sometimes I think it succeeds. And for that reason I can't help but feel charmed by it. The 8-bit recreations of film locations like the Visitor's Center and the Power Shed and the Raptor Cage are all wonderfully quaint. And the environments, frustrating though they are to navigate, are at least nice to look at with their forests and fences and occasional volcanic popcorn machine. Sure, Grant and Lex and especially Tim look like weird little Lego homunculi, but it only adds to the charm for me. But the stars of the game are undoubtedly the dinosaurs, which is good, because when it comes to Jurassic Park, dinosaurs are entirely the point. And there are a surprising amount of them too. You've got your raptors, your bouncing dilophosauruses, and your little swarming compies, your main adversaries across the game, and you've got the stampeding triceratopses and rampaging T-Rex reserved for the boss fights. But there are others. Long-necked brachiosaurs block your path in the brief river rafting section, dolphin-like ichthyosaurs leap across bridges in level 5, and if you're lucky you'll even catch a glimpse of a stegosaurus in level 3. Did you see it? Here, let me show you again. I only saw the stegosaurus twice, and even then only noticed it while watching the footage back to take notes, but I love that it's there. There's also this thing, which I only got the briefest glimpse of. I'm pretty sure it's a Dimetrodon, and that's kind of why I find it so charming. You know exactly what they're meant to be the second you see them, even if you only see them for a second. They read clean. They are fantastic 8-bit representations of their film counterparts. Even their animations are charming. I especially love how Grant's hat floats sadly to the ground when he gets eaten whole by the T-Rex. But that is all I love about the encounters with the T-Rex. There are two in all. One at the end of the second level, where you must battle the T-Rex while escorting Lex out of harm's way, and a rematch at the end of the game where you must protect both children. I'm not joking when I say they are the exact same fight. Put footage of the two encounters side by side and you'll see that the T-Rex makes the exact same moves in the exact same order in both encounters. There is nothing random about these boss battles. Everything is fixed. The only difference between them is that the first fight starts with the T-Rex at half health and you're given only one child to escort through the encounter. Of my two hours playthrough, these two fights took a total of 25 minutes. 10 for the first and 15 for the second. Even learning the T-Rex's pattern through the use of save states, this thing kicked my ass. The Rex might be predictable, but it's still fast, built like a tank, and failing to remember a step in the pattern means certain death, or at least wasted ammo. Stand anywhere near its feet and you'll get stomped. Stand anywhere near its head and you'll get eaten. But when the stars align, and you learn a straight attack is coming, you can destroy the Rex's health bar in seconds. On its own it would be annoying. Having to escort NPCs through the fight ratchets it up to infuriating. Keeping Lex and Tim from following you right into the T-Rex's jaws is what caused these fights to take up nearly an entire quarter of my playtime. They seem to follow Grant at random, usually right as you're setting up a shot. If you can't get them to move within the opening moments of the fight, the Rex will just dart in and swallow them whole before the battle even begins. Keeping them out of the way is just as much a battle as fending off the T-Rex, but hey, at least their death screams are funny. <laughs> But once you crest that hill and defeat the T-Rex, the nightmare will be over. There's nothing left to do but step onto the helipad, put your name on the leaderboard, and return to the main menu, suddenly aware of the horrific knowledge that this screen was the best part of the game all along. As a video game in and of itself, Jurassic Park for the NES is just a frustrating time sink. As an adaptation of the film, it's not without its charms, but the occasional 8-bit recreation of a movie location does not a good game make. This game is hard, this game is cruel, this game is eggs. We can only go uphill from here. At first glance, Jurassic Park for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System looks like a 16-bit version of its 8-bit NES counterpart. After all, the two games were made by the same team. The two games are both top-down shooters, and you complete the same objectives in much the same order on your journey to escape Jurassic Park, like restoring the power and destroying raptor nests. Some of the dinosaur sprites look and act like 16-bit updates of their original 8-bit designs. Alan Grant controls almost identically in both versions, complete with off-center aiming problems on some of the weapons. There are keycards, there's constant spawning dinosaurs, there's eggs, oh no. The two games even start the exact same way with the player dumped unceremoniously in front of the iconic Jurassic Park gate, but that is where the similarities end. Welcome to Jurassic Park. Instead of six tedious levels, Jurassic Park for the Super Nintendo consists of one enormous open world. The player is given free access to Jurassic Park in its entirety from the very first second of the game, excepting a handful of locked doors and barred gates. Sure, it's nowhere near the size or scale of open world games these days, or even something like the Spencer Mansion of the original Resident Evil. But for a SNES game meant to be played from start to finish in one sitting, it feels... huge. 
According to an interview back in a 1993 issue of SNES Force, Ocean Software, the developers, after securing the video game rights to the film, were told by Steven Spielberg that he wanted the tie-in adaptation to be, quote, a groundbreaking game, end quote. And why shouldn't it be? Jurassic Park is a story about the dangers of groundbreaking technology. The film was among the first to rely on computer-generated special effects to depict its dinosaurs. How do you continue that legacy in a Super Nintendo game? I'd like to think Gary Bracey, the man being interviewed by SNES Force back in the day, went to his team and asked, what kind of game do we want to make? One person put up their hand and said, let's do a top-down shooter. Another put up their hand and said, let's do Wolfenstein 3D. And the mad bastards decided to do both. It seems quaint and horribly antiquated by the standards of today, but for 1993 a first-person shooter, on the SNES no less, would have indeed been groundbreaking. In fact, Jurassic Park for the SNES even beat Doom to the shelves, at least in North America. It's still kind of crazy to me that Ocean Software decided to go with both ideas, but they divided them up well, with the big open park area being a top-down shooter and the various smaller interior sections being first-person. Seen side by side, they look like entirely different games, and they play like entirely different games too. The only similarity between them being the icons in the HUD. In that same interview, Gary Bracey mentions, quote, inevitable creative differences, end quote, in the team, and yeah, I can tell. The top-down overworld is fast and mean and ready to tear your throat out. Mechanically, there is little to differentiate it from the NES game, so I won't repeat myself here. The mystery boxes are gone, and good riddance to them, honestly. The eggs remain, but there are only 18 to collect across the entire map, and they are much easier to find overall. Dinosaurs no longer drop ammo upon death. Instead, you need to find ammo pickups hidden around the game world. The same is true with health and lives, and the game is stingy with both. It's not afraid to play dirty by spawning dinosaurs right in front of you, or getting you stuck on wonky level geometry, or starving you of supplies. You need to be quick on the draw if you want to keep from being overwhelmed. It is very easy to die in the top-down overworld map. And I did. A lot. The same is not true of the first-person interiors. As soon as you enter one of these sections, the game slows down from a frantic, offensive top-down shooter that puts emphasis on speed and reflexes and positioning, much like the NES game, to a methodical defensive dungeon crawler. And when I say it slows down, I mean that literally. I have not edited this footage at all. The interiors really do run at this speed. Controlling Grant in these sections feels loose and clunky, like you're trying to walk underwater. It's almost the complete opposite to the tight and responsive controls of the overworld. It's jarring at first, but eventually the brain adjusts, and you learn to account for the laggy camera and the clunky controls. Even before that adjustment, I found these sections much more compelling to play than the overworld. Not just because of how novel it was to play a first-person shooter for the SNES, but because the environments are much more interesting. Sure, each building has its fair share of blank walls, but each of them has something unique about them too. The ship is obviously the ship, the visitor's center is obviously the visitor's center. They are all visually distinct, and each of them has character. Take the windows overlooking the interior of the raptor pen filled with bright green leaves, or the server-filled control room in the visitor's center. They evoke the style and design of the film, and give the game much more character than the comparatively generic jungle-covered overworld, even if the buildings are still drawn out in Wolfenstein 3D-esque, nightmarish abstract, rather than feeling like lived-in spaces. The interiors do start to wear out their welcome toward the end, even with multiple floors. The buildings at the beginning feel just about the right size for what they are, but the dungeons in the second half of the game bloat out into featureless labyrinths that take ages to explore. The raptor nest and the boat are probably the worst offenders. The former with its Windows 95 screensaver maze style design, and the latter with its seemingly hundreds of empty cabins to get lost in. But for the most part, these first-person interiors were my favourite parts of the game, not least of all because they were much more forgiving than the fast-paced overworld. This is where those inevitable creative differences I mentioned before rear their heads. The two halves of the game are not just obviously mechanically different, they have very different difficulty levels, and the interiors are clearly set too easy. Like I mentioned before, the overworld is fickle in handing out health and extra lives, and while it is a little more generous with ammo, these items do not respawn once picked up unless you die. Not true of the interiors. Not only is each and every building overflowing with extra ammo and health, but it all respawns every time you reset the area. Even going up and down in the elevators will bring it all back. There's so much you'll be tripping over extra ammo you don't actually need, or indeed want. Similarly, in a stroke of game design brilliance that allows me to compare Jurassic Park for the Super Nintendo to Dark Souls, if you play through the game from start to finish in one life, every dinosaur you kill will stay dead for the rest of the playthrough. This is consistent across both the overworld and the interiors. The larger dinosaurs will even leave corpses you have to jump over if you don't blow them up with a rocket launcher when taking them out. By the end of the game you can have single-handedly solved the island's dinosaur problem the way Robert Muldoon, the park's warden, would have wanted. 
Guns, guns, and more guns. The one exception to this rule is the raptors. Like the NES game, they have set spawn points along jungle trails from which they will never stop appearing. The same is not true of the interiors though. Once indoors, the raptors don't respawn, except maybe in their underground nest, but it's hard to tell, it has multiple routes and exits. Otherwise, once you've cleared out a building, it stays cleared, leaving you free to scavenge supplies as you please. Indeed, once indoors, the raptors barely do anything. Some of them strut from side to side, but for the most part they just stand in place and wait for you to kill them. Same as the spitting Dilophosaurs, the only other dinosaur present in the first person sections. You can get quite close to them before they aggro too. Early on it is almost impossible to get hit until the game goes out of its way to hide a dinosaur right behind a door or a wall, somewhere you can't see them, and so are tricked into getting close enough to set them off. The dinosaurs in the overworld will chase you down and bully you for your lunch money, but the dinosaurs indoors will just wait for you to show up and end their lives. This is definitely to account for how clunky the indoor controls are. It takes so long to reposition yourself or even just turn around, that if the indoor dinosaurs were as dangerous as the overworld dinosaurs, the game would be genuinely unfair. But in nerfing the dinosaurs so much, I feel they overcompensated too far in the opposite direction. It was only on the ship, the last big indoor area of the game, that I was actually challenged by the interior dinosaurs to the point where I actually died. And that was much more due to their sheer numbers in the cramped spaces of the boat than because their behaviour had changed at all, although their aggro range did appear to have increased. In contrast, the overworld dinosaurs started out as much more challenging and slowly got easier as I cleared them out, though the challenge never completely went away. The lowered aggression of the interior dinosaurs isn't the only way the first person sections make an effort to lessen the difficulty for players who were, at the time, unfamiliar with the genre and its clunky controls either. The goal of entering the aforementioned underground raptor nest is to drop a canister of nerve gas amongst the eggs to wipe them out. You have to go for a whole other area of the park to get the nerve gas in this out of the way utility shed behind a locked door, but once you get it to the centre of the maze-like nest and set it to go off, the game tells you to get out before you run out of time. The thing is, there's no actual countdown. You can get lost and take as much time as you please finding your way out of the nest, it doesn't matter. The canister will always go off the moment you escape. The overworld would never have been so kind. The NES game certainly wasn't. The presence of an actual countdown timer in the NES game makes me think there used to be one here too, but due to the clunky controls and the labyrinthine level design they decided to take it out rather than present the player with a potentially unfair fail state in a game that is already quite difficult. Half of it anyway. On paper it shouldn't work, yet somehow the top-down overworld and the first-person interiors blend together to create a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. There is a sense of atmosphere and adventure here that wasn't present in the NES game. Jurassic Park for the Super Nintendo genuinely captures the feeling of trying to escape a dinosaur-infested island by the skin of your teeth, whether prowling through the corridors of the visitor's center or sneaking through a forest swarming with raptors. It gets that sense of journey in a way the NES game never did. There was even a rare oh wow moment when I finished exploring the tunnels under the raptor cage, only to find that it led back to the control room of the visitor's center, which I had gone through hours earlier. The whole game feels connected and consistent, overworld and interiors both, and the backtracking, though tedious to some degree, gives you a sense that you're making progress, that you're growing stronger, that you're slowly bringing order back to the island after the chaos of the power outage and the dinosaur escape, like how you can activate a motion tracker in the bottom of your HUD to detect nearby dinosaurs once you've performed a system reboot. That sense of journey does fade over time though. My playthrough for this game took me 5 hours and 40 minutes, almost 3 times as long as its NES counterpart, which is crazy for a game that's meant to be played in a single sitting. You get 4 lives before you game over. You do get a checkpoint every time you enter or exit a building, or if you touch one of these poles littered throughout the overworld, but given the difficulty I'd be amazed if most players got far enough into the game for them to be of any use. With the benefit of save states I was able to bypass a lot of the artificial if intended difficulty, and it still took me over 5 hours to complete as I said, though I would be lying if I said most of that time was spent either backtracking through places I'd already been through, or wandering lost in search of the next area I needed to visit as I stubbornly refused to use a walkthrough. Not that you really need one. Even wandering around blind I eventually found my way, and if you actually paid attention to the location of locked doors and the keys you need to open them, like I did not, you'd probably have an easier time of it. There were only two parts of this game that really stumped me, and the first was this box. This fucking box. One of the objectives you need to complete is to stop the raptors from getting into the visitor's center, and to do that you need to venture beneath the raptor cage and push this box in front of this door. Nowhere in the game does it tell you you need to do this, nor does it really indicate that you've done it correctly. I made three whole trips down to this box and I had to take the long way each time, because the shortcut through the visitor's center is only one way until you find a keycard you cannot access until after you complete this objective. This box is the exact moment when I fell out of step with this game. Everything after 
it just became a little bit too long, a little bit too tedious. Having to make the long trip multiple times just soured me on the experience in a way my other stumbling point did not. That stumbling point being these dark rooms. The game tells you that you need night vision goggles to enter. I thought that meant you'd need to find a pair of goggles, and certainly you find batteries for them in most of the buildings, but the game never tells you the batteries are all you need. I spent probably close to an hour searching for goggles that did not exist, unaware that I already had access to the dark rooms, most of which I never needed to enter anyway. Aside from a couple of essential areas, they are bonus rooms, some with enemies, some with extra health and ammo, but overall optional. Not that I ever minded, the extra pickups were always welcome. I was only ever on the lookout for two kinds of ammo though. There are a bunch of weapons here, and they are actually weapons this time round, not just colour-coded balls for normal strong piercing and spin. You've got your cattle prod, useful only for opening the occasional door and clearing out trash mobs. You've got a shotgun, which I never used, a useless gas grenade that only puts dinosaurs to sleep for a few seconds if you can even hit them at all, and a bunch of darts that I never really bothered with, though they seem powerful enough. No, once I found the golden combination of the rocket launcher and the bowlers, I never looked back. Both are one-hit kills that obliterate everything in their way. The only difference between them is that the bowlers are piercing, and if you line things up just right, then the resulting dino devastation is magical. The number of dinosaurs present in the game is roughly the same as the NES game, but the roster is significantly different. The raptors return mostly unchanged, though they're bigger and faster than they used to be. The compies are back too, but they'll only ever try their luck if you turn their back to them, which is nice. The Dilophosaurs no longer bounce in place, they're just as active as the raptors, and they're not afraid to snipe you from off screen. New additions include hordes of Gallimimus, which will stampede if you get near, these giant dragonflies that move in unpredictable patterns, though they aren't really dinosaurs, and these pairs of patchy cephalosaurs that will bully you back to the Cretaceous. God, I hate these things. It's a charming assortment of enemies, but what about the boss monsters? Well, the Triceratops is now just an environmental hazard, mechanically no different from these falling boulders found across the map. And the T-Rex is no longer a tedious boss battle, but an easily avoided obstacle. In exactly two spots on the map, if you happen to get too close to a wall of trees, she will emerge and chase you down a corridor before retreating back into the jungle, assuming you're fast enough to get away. She can't be killed, only held back by the more powerful weapons in the game, but with an optimal route, you'd barely ever see her. Not that you'd realise it with how often the game warns you about her presence. It doesn't matter how many times you pass through this area of the game, Ellie Sattler will always be there to warn you about the T-Rex, just like she and Tim will be there to warn you about other hazards too. Every. Single. Time. This is right outside the visitor center. You're going to be seeing this card a lot. I got hit and even killed while these cards were blocking half the screen. They pop up when you touch the checkpoint poles too, though in this case they're usually just to give you your next objective. The pixelated representations of the movie characters are pretty silly, but there is a certain charm to them, and their presence gives the feeling that you're not alone on the island like in the NES game, that there are other survivors running around trying to help put things right too. I especially liked how Nedry's cards give bad advice. It's a nice weird touch that only adds to the charm, and that's what I would use if I had to sum up this game in a word. Charming. The game oozes with it, especially for a fan of both the book and the movie. The devs clearly had a lot of love for the source material with how they incorporated aspects of both works into the game. There are big moments like the process of restarting the power from the movie and exploring the secret underground raptor nest from the book, but there are little things too, like the fractal that forms in the backgrounds of these interactive terminals being the same fractal used by Crichton at the start of each section of the book. You have a wealth of them to choose from too. It's an entirely unnecessary feature, but I love that it's there. Wait. Why is one of them called Bert? That doesn't look like Bert at all! The whole terminal section in itself is charming with Dr. Grant's giant pointing hand, and it's far from the only little bit of extra work the team put into the game. Things like how Grant holds his hat when jumping or how his hat floats when you leap into the water. Things like Mr. DNA's dino facts that pop up in the pause menu if you're in the overworld, or Nedry's bad advice. Things like how everyone in the movie has a keycard needed to open a locked door. Even the guests like Ellie Sattler and Dr. Malcolm, who have no business needing keycards at all. Even the short voice lines, deep fried and inaccurate though they are. Mr. Grant. I don't think Alan Grant went through however many years of college to be called Mr. Thank you very much. It's just all so charming and quaint and I can't help but like it. I love that they went the extra mile to put this stuff in. This game even came packaged with a real life competition, the Great Dino Egg Hunt. You may have noticed in some of the gameplay the presence of hidden letters around the overworld map. E, H, R, O, N, R, and E. You can't pick them up, they're just there. Find them all and they spell out Dr. Horner after Dr. Jack Horner, the paleontologist advisor on the film. 
games. The winner was awarded $5,000, and it only took him 10 hours of playtime in two days after the game's release to do it too. Why did it take so long? Well, the game cheated. They hid the last letter, this massive D, in a secret room inside another secret room in an out-of-the-way section of the overworld map. The door to which is crushed into the corner of this walkway. The great dino egg hunt was rigged, and it still only took someone 48 hours. I love it. If I have any major criticism, it is the pacing. The game allows you to tackle its various objectives in almost any order, but as a result it doesn't build to a climax like its NES counterpart did. There's no final battle against the T-Rex or an Alpha Raptor to overcome. The terminal to call for a rescue helicopter on board the ship isn't even located at the end of the dungeon. It's just in a random room in the middle of the level. The challenge isn't getting to it, but getting the security level high enough to access it in the first place. But once you complete that final task of making contact with the mainland and collect all the eggs, all that's left to do is make your way to the helipad and fly away. There's no sense of achievement or accomplishment. This bizarre little cutscene is all the ending you get. It is awful, but at least I got the highest score. Get shit on, John D. I really want to love this game, because there is so much to love about it. My entire life I've dreamed of the perfect Jurassic Park game, unaware that it mostly already existed as this title. For the time it was groundbreaking, and even today it holds up well. I would even go so far as to say it is the best Jurassic Park game, but there's just no getting around it. This game just collapses under its own weight in the second half, which is such a shame. That said, compared to its NES counterpart, this game is great. About the only thing that could have made it better would be if it gave you the option to play as the dinosaurs instead. That's a bad sign. An old marketing campaign from back in the day claimed that Sega does what Nintendo don't, and what Nintendo don't is let you play as the dinosaurs. Jurassic Park for the Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive is a side-scroller divided into two campaigns, one starring Alan Grant and one starring a Velociraptor, both on a quest to escape the island before their enemies devour them. On paper this is a fantastic change of pace, but in practice it's rotten. This game sucks. It is a joyless experience from beginning to end, whether you're sneaking along as Dr. Grant or strutting across the island as the Raptor. I played both campaigns in a single two hour sitting, and it felt almost three times as long as that. If not for my very real Sega Genesis allowing for save states, I have no idea how long this game would have taken me to beat, even with the in-game password save system. The reason for that comes down to two aspects of the gameplay, the difficulty and the controls. These problems affect both campaigns, but we'll start with Grants. It's ironic that so far this is the game that gives the most amount of in-game context for what happened to land you stranded in the middle of the park, because it feels like the most jarring beginning out of all of them so far. You begin between a crashed jeep and a triceratops. Uh oh. This Triceratops is the entire game in microcosm. It will bully you up and down the platform, even if you stand still and do nothing. I don't have footage of it unfortunately, but on a test run of the game I did off camera, I got stuck in a loop where the Triceratops would throw me over itself, turn around, and immediately throw me again, so quickly that I really couldn't get away from it. And this is entirely due to the controls. The controls feel like you're walking on slippery ice, which is a real problem when the platforming requires pixel-perfect precision at times. Jumping from ledge to ledge could be an absolute crapshoot, as can trying to climb up ladders or trying to swing from hanging wires, but by far the hardest part of the game was trying to land a jump from a hanging position. Most of the time you'll just fall straight down. Crouching is at least functional, and you do need it to travel through tight spaces at times, but it's useless against enemy projectiles. The game's speed and difficulty demand quick response times, but these controls can make some damage unavoidable. You are at their mercy from the second you hit start to the moment you reach the end of the game. It's ironic that the literal boat you drive in level 3 somehow felt more responsive than Grant himself. Even if the controls were responsive like the controls of the Nintendo games we've covered so far, this game's challenge is so high it would probably be no less difficult. This game is hard, cruelly so. I'd say unfairly so if not for the password system allowing you to level select, especially in the Raptor campaign. You can't kill the dinosaurs in this game the way you could in the NES or SNES games. You can only knock them down for a few seconds at a time. The more powerful red weapons put enemies down faster and for longer, but they still get back up after a few seconds, or at least the raptors do. The one exception I think being these pteranodons who pinwheel their way off the screen out of shame when you're actually able to hit them. <laughs> Even then, scroll the screen far enough to disappear the downed dinosaurs, and when you return they'll just have respawned. This isn't so bad when the dinosaurs are in easily accessible places, but sometimes the game puts them in positions where you cannot hit them if you can see them. 
the only way to take them out is to climb up somewhere high and lob grenades at them until they go down and hope you don't move far enough away to reset them. The game loves doing this too. It loves placing Dilophosaurs, the only dinosaur with projectile attacks, close to ladders or ropes you have to traverse, or around places where you just can't avoid their attacks, like this tunnel in the fifth level. I was never able to shoot it before it could shoot off one green gob of death spit. Even worse, these things can see you from off screen and will rain hell at you from afar, though you can't see them. It's awful. Aside from that, the game loves spawning dinosaurs either directly ahead of you or directly behind you, or even directly above you. It loves putting dinosaurs close to instant death hazards. It loves hiding the path you need to take to complete the level in out of the way areas. It's a level of challenge that is just not fun to play, and this was on normal. I dread to think of what this game is like to play on hard. Even if you manage to avoid the dinosaurs, that still leaves the environmental hazards. As usual, Grant can't swim in water. He can't swim in lava or acid either, although that's slightly more understandable. Except when he can, apparently. The game loves just covering every single level with these sorts of hazards. Rarer are these electrical hazards. One point in the second level requires you to climb up a lattice of cables buzzing with electricity, and if you get hit once, you're going all the way back down. Oh yeah, this is fair. Fuck off, game. The T-Rex is reduced to an environmental hazard you have to avoid again as well. She'll just pop through a wall and roar at you until you get past. But by far the greatest environmental hazard in the game is its verticality. The fall damage in this game is shit. It's just shit. Falling from a great height kills you instantly, even if there's a platform below you, and even if you have the health to tank it. Like there's a threshold Grant crosses and suddenly it's lethal. You're going to be falling a lot too, because like I mentioned before, the platforming is so slippery and temperamental that more often than not, you're just going to slide right off the side of a ledge and die. There are sections in the fourth mission where you have to cross tight gaps with barely visible pipes hanging from the ceiling. It is possible to make the jumps but only sometimes, and other times you'll leap the gap no problem and just die anyway. What's far more frustrating is when you're low on health, which will be often, and have to make a small fall. Even if it doesn't actually hurt you when you've got more health, if you attempt this fall and others like it when your HP is low, it will just kill you! I had no option but to restart the second level because of this. It is shit, and I hate it. But then sometimes it will just let you make the jump like it did here, or will kill you when you have high health like it did here, and sometimes you'll just die on literally fucking nothing. This isn't like I was hit by a compy spawning in, which also happens sometimes. There is nothing there, unless this tiny bit of broken level geometry had a damage box put on it. I wouldn't mind so much if it was consistent, but it just isn't. At all. It's awful. The game's not even that nice to look at either. Overall, it's pretty ugly. The levels are all visually distinct, but only in terms of colour palette. Otherwise, the backgrounds all tend toward visual mud. The character sprites are way worse though, some more than others. Grant, the raptors and the T-Rex are all animated from scanned video recordings and photographs, the same way early Mortal Kombat characters were animated. And you can really tell. I know pixel graphics back in the day were designed to be seen on CRT televisions with a certain amount of visual fuzz. They were not meant to be examined in detail at a crispy 1080p, but come on! These can't have looked good even back at release. They stand out so much from the rest of the game, and not in a good way. They don't look or move anything like anything else in this game. All the other dinosaurs and moving bits of the environment at least look like they belong together. It's so distracting and you never get used to it. The muddiness of the visuals makes it hard to read what's going on sometimes too. Take the T-Rex for example, you can stun it with the right weaponry, but there's no visual indication that you've done so. It will still move its head around like normal, the only difference is it won't try to attack you when you get close. It's really confusing. Perhaps what's most frustrating is that there are moments of visual flair. This big tank thing in the pump station, the electrical generators in the power station, the volcano in the background of the canyon, this bloody lift in the visitor's center, the cascades and rivers of the third level overall, this swarming nest of compies in the pump station, which is genuinely my favorite thing about this game because of how unique it is. The T-Rex leaving Grant's hat behind when she eats him makes a return, the one constant in this sea of time games. And the way Grant teeters on ledges if left idle is kind of charming, I'll admit. The way he shrugs sometimes like, well, I'm fucked, is pretty good too. There are some great background moments with the dinosaurs as well. This raptor races to ambush you at the vents in the visitor center, another can be seen munching on a dead Dilophosaur in the pump station, and a few can even be found sleeping around the levels. There is obvious potential here, and when it clicks, it's fantastic, it stays with you, but it so often doesn't. 
Just look at how boring the visitor's centre is. There's none of the charm from the movie and none of the atmosphere either. This is the final level and it's just a series of drab grey rooms. This failure to capture the atmosphere of the movie is something prevalent throughout the game. Visually the biggest connection between the game and the film are the opening cutscenes of each campaign and the level interludes depicting Isla Nublar. Within the moment to moment gameplay, aside from Grant, the Raptors, the Rex and a handful of background elements, there's very little to connect the two at all. You could take them out and rename the game Dino Attack and it would feel just as bland, perhaps more appropriately so. True, it does depict the iconic T-Rex attack on the tour cars and is so far the only game to have made the attempt, but it's just a momentary cutscene. None of it makes it into actual gameplay. It also adapts the climactic showdown between Grant and the Raptors, from both perspectives even, but it is not a good fight on either side, as I will get into shortly. You do go through the power station, though everything's already working, there's no button you have to press, and the layout of the level ruins the claustrophobic atmosphere of the building as it was presented in the film. The only other moment from the movie that the game even attempted to recreate in gameplay were the crawl spaces above the rooms of the visitor's center, and I feel like that is really stretching it. Otherwise all this other shit is just an invention on the game's part, unless the erupting volcano level was an early attempt at adapting Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, in which case, uh, good job, the game's awfulness accurately captures the feeling of watching that film. Ironically, the game does a pretty good job of adapting moments from the original book, like the river chase scene and the raptors escaping to the mainland, but that's about it. You don't even venture through a raptor nest or board a boat like you do in the other games. Instead, Grant's campaign plays out like this. Level 1 is the jungle. Each level has a gimmick and for this level it's this neat section of looping vertical terrain that will repeat until you cross over to the exit area. For a first level it is a brutally unforgiving one, as I've already mentioned, but it's also the only mission not to feature the raptors as an enemy. Their introduction is saved for the second level, the power station, and what an introduction it is. There are all these buttons all over the level but you don't actually have to turn the power on, you just have to get to the end which is easier said than done. The third level Level, my favourite, is the River Rapids. Most of this level is spent riding around in a small boat. You need to collect fuel to keep it running, but it does offer a nice moment of non-linear level design, even if there are some parts that are just as crap as the rest of the game. The fourth mission, the pump station, is just the second level again really, but with some hatches you can open and much stricter jumping puzzles. The fifth level, the canyon, is just a repeat of the first with a different theme. There are boulders you need to avoid, or at least I assume they're boulders since it looks like the raptor is taking a massive fucking shit to me, but whatever, it's just more of the same. As is the sixth level, the volcano, which can be completed very quickly if you know where you need to go. The seventh and final level is the visitor's center. It introduces the revolutionary game mechanic of doors you can kick open, but otherwise it's just a series of bland corridors on the way to a final boss fight that is the real reason I wanted to talk about the game's pacing. I'll give the game this, it at least does have a final boss unlike the SNES game, but it's not very good. Your enemies are a pair of raptors beneath the skeletons located in the atrium of the visitor's center, instantly recognisable to anyone who's watched the film. Is it just me or do the skeletons look like they're about to kiss? The raptors are actually invincible, you can't even stun them. The only way to get through the fight is to attack the skeletons until they fall over. That's it. That's the boss. It is admittedly how the film was originally supposed to end, so it's kind of neat that it ended up here, but it's not a very engaging fight. At least we get an actual ending cutscene this time. Alright, I've put it off long enough. Let's talk about the raptor campaign. In abstract, this is a fantastic idea, especially for the time. Games where you get to play as the monster have become increasingly common over the last couple of decades, be they asynchronous multiplayer titans like Dead by Daylight and Left 4 Dead, or single player romps like Maneater, the objectively better Jaws Unleash Fight Me You Can't, and Stubbs the Zombie, which I previously covered. Back in the 90s though, this was an untapped well of potential, and this game set itself apart from its contemporaries by giving you the option to play as the villain. Unfortunately, a selling point is all this campaign is. It feels like it was thrown together at the last minute when they realised how little Grant's campaign had to offer and needed something to actually shift units. The raptor does control differently to Grant. The movement speed overall is faster and the attacks are close quarters lunges and bites rather than projectile weapons. The raptor can jump higher than the moon and also doesn't suffer from most instances of fall damage which is a relief. On the other hand, the raptor takes a little step when you turn around which can send you right off an edge to your death, which got real tired real fast. But that's about the extent of the differences between the campaigns, not the controls, although those are still pretty slippery. All right. That's a little unfair. The raptor campaign doesn't have items aside from the odd health pickup, but to offset that the raptor can eat the compies for a little extra HP, which is really cool. I'm glad they included it, even if the compies can sometimes kill you when you're trying to grab a bite to eat. 
The Raptor campaign also has unique enemies, the army of workers employed by Jurassic Park, and they can pack quite a punch. In wide open spaces they are a non-event, but in cramped tunnels they can be absolute nightmare demons that can hit you at range long before you get close enough to hit them. They can hit you through walls, and once one even pushed me through a solid object. The physics are really wonky, as are their models, which sometimes just change colour for no reason. They do at least go down in one hit, and once they're down, they're done. They don't respawn if you scroll the screen past them, but the dinosaurs still do, and it can be jarring when you go through a long section fighting only humans, only to encounter another Dilophosaur that suddenly jumps back up the moment you step too far off the screen. On the other hand, it does mean you effectively have infinite health if you find a compy spawn point, so swings and roundabouts. But that really is the extent of the differences between the two campaigns. The Raptor has no unique levels, they are all just repeats of the ones featured in Grant's campaign with slightly different routes. There are fewer of them even, only five instead of seven. The river level is gone, perhaps understandable given I don't think Raptors are capable of operating even the smallest of boats. But the volcano level is just gone. You even fall down at the end of the canyon level like you do in Grant's campaign to get to the volcano, but the Raptor just no clips her way over to the visitor center like it's nothing. I don't know why I'm completely the Raptor campaign is so difficult that the less of it there is the better. It felt like the developers bumped up the difficulty of Grant's campaign to artificially increase the playtime, but it really feels like they cranked it up to 11th for the Raptor campaign. Grant's campaign felt very challenging but ultimately fair, in as much as these early home console games can be considered such. The Raptor campaign doesn't. At all. The Raptor campaign just feels unfair, either due to lack of testing, from lack of time, or even by design. Take this section at the end of the pump station level. You have to kill all the human enemies here to unlock the level exit, and good luck! The tight corridors play against the raptor's strengths, and even if you get close they can usually strike you down before you can launch an attack. Far worse is this guy in the visitor center. He is in fact the last enemy you face before the final boss, but honestly he is much worse. If you get close to this guy, he is going to hit you. That's just a fact. Come at him from the vents, you're getting hit. Come at him from below, you're getting hit. Lunge attack, you're getting hit. Jump attack, you're getting hit. Stand still with him not even on the screen? Oh, you better believe you're getting hit. He spams attacks with no pause. There is no window to leap in and get him while he's recharging his cattle prod. If you have low health when you reach this guy, you're fucked. I was fucked. I had to restart the level in order to give myself even a chance at getting past him. And to be completely honest, I'm still not sure how I did get past him. I looked up a speedrun to check out the optimal strat, and it turns out the optimal strat is just to rush him until one of your attacks hits. I cannot even begin to comprehend how many controllers have been smashed due to this guy. This is atrocious game design. Compared to him, the final boss is nothing. Speaking of, the final boss is just the same as in Grant's campaign, but with the perspectives flipped. You've been chasing Grant across all seven, no, five levels, almost catching up to him at each and every turn, and he's finally here, cornered. It might have been interesting if the game treated him like a normal enemy, but it doesn't. Like the two final raptors in Grant's own campaign, he's invincible here, and hits just as hard as Mr. Go Fuck Yourself the last screen back. Once again, the only way to win is to attack the skeletons. You don't even get to eat him once you win, he just runs off, but hey, at least you make it off the island. I would be a bit more forgiving of all this if at least the game was nice to listen to, but it isn't. I haven't mentioned sound and music much in the previous sections because for the most part they've been nothing but your usual classic Nintendo bleeps and bloops. You've been listening to the music of each game as I've been speaking, but the only one of any note in my opinion is the main menu music from the SNES game, which you got a sample of at the start of that game's section. What sets this game apart from the others we've covered so far is that it actually features the noises made by the dinosaurs from the film. Some of them anyway. The problem is, you're going to be hearing them a lot. A lot, a lot. Sometimes the game just spams these sounds at you even if you're nowhere near the dinosaurs making them. And not just the dinosaurs either. The soundscape of the second mission is just a wall of electrical buzzing. It's awful. And the music is little better. Like so many aspects of the game, it feels unfinished, and at the risk of venturing into tinfoil hat territory, I'd be shocked if this is the game the developers, like Joe find a cooler name you fucking can't shoe pack, wanted to make. An article in Sega Visions about the game makes some bold claims that I have to bring into question. Putting aside the fact that the article outright spoils about a third of the game's content by providing maps of several levels detailing where to find all of the health and ammunition pickups, which I really don't understand, why did they do that? 
that, the article claims the game utilises quote, artificial dinosaur intelligence, unquote, patent presumably pending. According to the article, this means the dinosaurs react differently to your playstyle every time you run the game, that maybe sometimes a raptor would attack you, while others it would leave you alone, but that's simply not true. They will always attack. Nor is it true that both campaigns span 13 levels each, another claim the article makes multiple times. Grant's campaign runs 7 levels and the Raptors campaign runs 5, which, even when added together, still only gets you to 12, so I don't know where they got the number 13 from. The article mentions the goal of Grant's campaign is to rescue some people trapped in the visitor centre, but you never actually encounter any other human beings in his campaign, nor do the level interludes ever mention that this is what you're trying to do. The article makes mention of how the developers visited zoos to research the way animals are kept, and even consulted Jack Horner's sworn nemesis Robert Backer on their portrayal of the dinosaurs. Absolutely none of this feels like it made it into the game. Where did all this effort go? Accompanying the article is concept art depicting things that never made it into the game, which suggests to me that maybe the game was originally envisioned with two 13 level long campaigns featuring artificial dinosaur intelligence, patent pending, but they just ran out of time or money or space on the cartridge, or maybe the article was just talking shit to sell copies. Because the game I played for this video feels like it was thrown out the door half finished with the raptor campaign slapped on as an afterthought. I don't know. The article even explains why some of the character models look so damn ugly. The developers got hold of a couple of maquettes made for the film, the Raptor and the T-Rex specifically, and were able to scan stop motion animations of them into the game, the same way they videotaped one of themselves cosplaying as Grant to provide the character movements. And boy can you tell. The article is right about one thing though. There are indeed seven dinosaurs, but we've already encountered all but one. The raptors, compies, dilophosaurs, triceratops, and the T-Rex are all mainstays. The Brachiosaurus returns from the NES game, and you can even ride them here. You can ride the Triceratops too if you're brave enough. The only addition to the roster are the Pteranodons, and they are just as ugly and annoying as every other enemy in the game. I've really got nothing to say about them. At least they look funny when they're falling out of the sky. Overall, this game just feels rushed out the door. Aside from all the things mentioned in the article that are absent in the game itself, you get the sense Blue Sky Software aiming for something much bigger, something much grander. Take the power station level. It's covered in buttons, but you can only interact with one or two, as though they tore out the mechanic when they ran out of time and just left all the doors in the level open. Take the entirety of the Raptor campaign, which felt very last minute. Take this mysterious eighth dot on the interlude map. All of the others represent a level, at least in Grant's campaign, but this is just the ending cinematic for both runs. But by far the biggest evidence that the developer wasn't given the time to complete the game they wanted to make is that the very next year in 1994, they released a pseudo remake called Jurassic Park Rampage Edition, which is a very different experience, but not one we'll be talking about for a while. Whatever the case regarding its development and release, Jurassic Park for the Sega Genesis does a poor job of capturing the magic of its source material. It is a clunky, difficult time sink of a game, and I will be happy to never play it again. Jurassic Park for the Sega Game Gear came at me like a bucket of cold water. I had never heard of this game before I started work on this video, and I'm guessing the vast majority of the people watching haven't heard of it either. Which is honestly a shame because this little game is charming. Not that you'd get that idea from the game's opening moments. The main menu is completely silent, and the pixelated T-Rex skeleton is, let's be honest, a little crunchy. That all changes the second you hit the start button. Not only do we get an opening cinematic, it's fairly long and it's pretty well animated for a handheld console too. The dinosaurs depicted might not be film accurate, boy are they not film accurate, but the style works, like something out of an old comic book, or indeed an anime. The dinosaurs have escaped, perhaps unsurprisingly, and Alan Grant is once again the man to get them back in their cages, though he's looking a little more blonde and a little more hatless than I remember him. What's surprising is that he's not alone, Isla Nublar is fully staffed and they're all working to help deal with the dinosaur problem too, which is a pretty faithful reflection of the situation as it is in the books. You even get to see a few of them in gameplay, albeit briefly. Once the game's introduction is over, you're dumped into the level select screen. There are five levels in total, four of which are accessible from the beginning of the game and must be completed in order to unlock the final mission, the Visitor's Center. Each of them are focused on capturing a specific dinosaur, a Triceratops, a Pteranodon, a Velociraptor, a Brachiosaurus, and the T-Rex. It's all very Mega Man, though with fewer options. 
The game makes the most of its short playtime though. I completed the game in just under an hour, but even if I hadn't relied on save states to get me through for the sake of the video, I don't think it would have taken me much longer than that. These levels pack a tight amount of content into each of their two or three sections. You travel through a brachiosaur infested lagoon, a system of cliffside caves, a forest caught in the throes of a lightning storm, and yet another active volcano in your quest to recapture all of the dinosaurs. But before you can start sedating the escaped dinosaurs, you have to get to them first. Each level begins with a short on-rails driving section, a shooting gallery where you have to protect your vehicle on your commute to the actual mission. Just an average day of Sydney traffic, am I right? They are pretty simplistic mechanically. Your only obstacles are these rocks that throw the crosshair up when the car passes over them, and the button mashing prowess of your own fingers. But they add more than just a little variation to the main gameplay loop. Failing these sections doesn't result in a game over, it just moves you forward to the start of the actual level and gives you a lower score. But do well and you can knit yourself extra lives and even extra health points. I only figured this out about halfway through my playthrough, but shoot these gas cans dropped by the dinosaurs and your health will permanently increase for the rest of that level, which was a real help on the final mission. Going through the game with three health points is very doable, but having five gives you so much more margin for error. These driving sections even have their own bosses that don't appear anywhere else in the game too. These T-Rexes weren't too bad, and it was always funny to see them just suck their heads into their bodies out of shame when you defeat them. But these Pteranodons sucked. Not just because a rock would appear every time they would fly in for another attack and throw off my aim, but because they were so hard to hit. The other driving bosses stay on the same plane at all times, making it relatively easy to keep them at bay. But the Pteranodons fly all over the place and are so fast they can easily outpace your shots. They are awful. This is a trend throughout the game overall, in fact. Flying enemies were generally much more frustrating to fight than the landbound dinosaurs. These pteranodons at the lagoon, these ornithocyruses, I guess, that are inexplicably inside the power station, and who could forget the most famous dinosaur of all, a hurricane. Ironically, the only flying enemy not to give me any grief was the boss pteranodon. This was mostly due to the controls. The movement controls are pretty responsive, at least compared to the Genesis game, but there is definitely lag on the weapons. Weapons I did not know existed until I found myself facing the final boss with a gun that could not damage it. You have three in all, but the starting weapon, this Contra-esque gun, was so reliable a workhorse I never considered there might be others until the final boss demanded that I check. The other two are a grenade launcher that shoots up at an angle, which probably would have made the flying enemies easier in hindsight, and a flare that shoots up a pillar of fire when you throw it. I never really used them until the very end of my playthrough, so can't really comment on their efficacy, but even if I had used them to solve their intended problems, Grant's massive hitbox still would have caused a few issues. This thing is massive, way bigger than the sprite meant to represent it. The flying enemies had no problem hitting it, and neither did the bosses. That was more the exception than the rule though. For the first time in the series it was the environmental hazards that were the biggest hurdle, rather than the dinosaurs. Hurricanes, lightning bolts, bouncing boulders, giant trees erupting into flame, crashing waves of lava, steam hissing from pipes, Jurassic Park's state-of-the-art laser defense system, spared no expense. These were the real dangers in this game, not the prehistoric attractions. It got to the point where eventually the dinosaurs just took the hint and started becoming environmental hazards as well. Not that they didn't skimp on the dinosaurs. This game might have the most extensive roster yet. You've got this very purple T-Rex and this very blue Velociraptor, and these absolutely horrifying Brachiosaurs. Jesus Christ, they make my skin crawl. You got Dilophosaurs, Triceratops, Pachycephalosaurs, and Pteranodons, also Rans one and all. But you've also got Nothosauruses, Proceratosaurs, and even Baryonyx. Even for a dinosaur nerd like me, these are some obscure animals. This is also the first game not to feature compies, and you know what? Good riddance. I never liked them. Useless trash mobs. None of the dinosaurs look very much like their movie counterparts, or even the level of realism that the film strived for. But they are unique, and they work for what the game is. In many ways they remind me of the designs of these old dinosaur toys I played with as a kid. None of them are very mechanically engaging to fight though. There might be a bunch of different land-based dinosaurs and a bunch of flying dinosaurs, but you fight them all in the same way. The only unique one among them mechanically is the Dilophosaur, and that's only because it spits acid at you. Much more interesting are the bosses. Sure, the Brachiosaur is very much a wait around to hit its weak point kind of boss, but it's worth it to see its interpretation of the surprise Pikachu meme. The Velociraptor is pretty crap too. Just stand on the middle platform and you're set, it will never hit you. But the other three bosses are where it's at. The Triceratops can be challenging at first, but line things up right and you can absolutely destroy its health. The T-Rex is a gimmick fight. You need to throw the flares to knock down these weird red boxes in the ceiling so that they hit the Rex, since conventional weaponry can't hurt it, which requires a bit of skill to pull off. But the Pteranodon was personally my favourite. 
This fight is the best of the lot, which is ironic because the level preceding it was my least favourite in the entire game. The boss arena is constantly scrolling, forcing you to keep moving the whole fight. The Pteranodon can come at you from different angles in different ways, and getting around it to catch it on the retreat, or jumping up to be quicker on the draw, was a lot of fun. It actually feels like a proper fight, and I felt victorious upon defeating it, something I haven't felt about any other boss battle in the series so far. Overall, this game does a pretty good job of making you feel like you're bringing order back to the park. Like the SNES game, there's a sense of journey as you travel to each part of the island and wrangle the dinosaurs back into captivity, all leading up to the final mission in the visitor center. There's no story, nor does the game make an attempt to directly adapt the movie or the book, but it captures the atmosphere perfectly. There's a section of the book, about halfway through, where the dinosaurs have escaped, but the humans are slowly resting control of the park back, and this game, tone-wise, is that section to a T. Especially with these little level-ending vignettes showing off the captured dinosaurs. It might not feel like you're getting through by the skin of your teeth, overall Grant is pretty powerful here, but the game has a couple of great set-piece moments, like the aforementioned driving sections and this massive tree fire, that give the whole experience a small sense of unpredictability. It keeps your hands on the buttons at all times, at no point does it run out of steam. Sure, it's not all hits. The platforming in the caves of the Pteranodon level sucks. You have to make such precise jumps onto moving platforms, it's awful, and it's the only way to progress too. These interior sections in the Velociraptor and the Brachiosaur levels are pretty boring as well, made much worse by their use of this absolutely atrocious clown music. <laughs> But at the very least, it's not just the same gameplay loop for the entire run. It even builds to a climactic gauntlet of dinosaurs and lasers with the Visitor's Center. The main four missions are all roughly the same level of difficulty, but the Visitor's Center is a cut above, and is actually fairly challenging. It doesn't just dump you inside, it takes its time to build up the atmosphere too, with Grant's slow walk up to the front doors as the scientists run screaming for the hills. This level was great. Frustrating at times, sure, but still great. There's a real sense of finality here that sets it apart from the rest of the game. My only real problem with it is this door puzzle right before the final boss. I'd honestly hesitate to even call it a puzzle. You just have to pick the right door, otherwise you're sent back to the start of the level. You see these rows of doors as you enter the visitor's center. It's not hard to put two and two together, but I could imagine it being very frustrating if you happen to pick the wrong door without thinking. It's a shame that the final battle with the Rex doesn't live up to the rising tension build across the game, but hey, it sticks the landing better than any game we've looked at so far. Just as you get a lengthy introduction, upon completing the game, you get a lengthy conclusion about the park restoring order, and ultimately opening to the public. All your hard work paid off. Now everyone can enjoy Jurassic Park, not only the children, but the adults as well. Although that's only if you get the good ending. The game actually has two, and the bad ending actually skews closer to established canon with the dinosaur escape resulting in the park's permanent closure before its doors even open. But I never got it, so you'll just have to look it up somewhere else on YouTube. That said, I love that it's there. This game's just fun. That's how I'd describe it, a fun, anime-esque interpretation of Jurassic Park. It's the first game I've played for this retrospective that never lost its momentum. It stayed consistently pretty good from start to finish, and never outstayed its welcome. It knew exactly what it wanted to do, and it did it. It's a little hidden gem of a game, and I'm glad I played it. I was apprehensive about starting Jurassic Park for the Sega CD. I decided to play these games and then talk about them in the order they're listed on the Wikipedia page dedicated to Jurassic Park tie-in video games, and as a result a pattern quickly emerged. The even-numbered games were not fantastic, but still pretty good, but the odd-numbered games were crap. I was dreading that trend would continue here given all I'd heard about how terrible the Sega CD was over the years. I needn't have worried. This game is lovely, but it's definitely not without its problems, which is why I'm so conflicted on it. There are parts of this game that I really like, and other parts that just sour the entire experience for me. Jurassic Park for the Sega CD is unique amongst the games we've covered so far in more ways than one. It's a point-and-click adventure, which immediately sets it apart from the sea of top-down shooters and side-scrollers I've already covered and will eventually get to in this video. It's also the first game to feature an original story, framing itself as a sequel to the film. It's also the first game to feature a proper save system, which was very much appreciated. It is a wonderful breath of fresh air after guiding Grant through the park so many times. I did two playthroughs of this game, both of which took about two hours to complete. The first I did blind. I figured I would be able to stumble my way to the finish line like I had the previous games I've covered. Boy was I wrong. The second playthrough I used a walkthrough, and there was no way I was ever going to get through this game on my own. I lucked out on some of the more obscure adventure game logic puzzles in my first run, but no. 
This was never going to happen on its own. The premise is simple, but it's a good hook. Like many of these Sega CD FMV originals, you're dumped into the role of a nameless grunt, sent by InGen to Isla Nublar to recover as many dinosaur eggs as you can after the events of the film. Oh god, not again. Why you're doing this when they presumably have the ability to make more elsewhere is never explained. But whatever, Isla Sauna didn't exist yet. It's a moot point anyway since your helicopter goes down while flying to the island and crashes on the beach. Now your task isn't just to collect as many dinosaur eggs as you can, but to find another way off the island before you're devoured. Sure, it's pretty bare bones as far as plots go these days, and the opening cinematic is pretty low effort, but it works, and it does a great job of building atmosphere. This isn't like the earlier games where the island had other people running around either by implication or appearance. You are the only human being present on Isla Nublar this time around. That sense of isolation is haunting. It hangs over the game as you travel the now abandoned roads and buildings, observing the devastation wrought by the free-roaming dinosaurs. Not all of it is as the film left it. It's pretty nice of the T-Rex to have rebuilt these skeletons in the visitor center, but even if it isn't completely accurate, the atmosphere is so good that I don't care. The game might not be attempting to adapt the film or the book in the same way the other games we've looked at so far have, aside from this one moment where the T-Rex attacks you through a waterfall, I guess, but it does do the best job of adapting the setting. It feels like you're able to step outside the camera frame and explore the island as if it were a real place and not a carefully constructed film set about to be watched away by a tropical cyclone. The backgrounds look great, whether indoors or out, and the way the dinosaurs move in and out of the scenes give it a real sense of realism, like you're watching wild animals in their natural habitat. Overall, the game world isn't a huge environment. It might actually be the smallest of all the games we've played so far, but it utilizes a sense of space and scale so well that it feels massive, the same way the film itself did. The sound design goes a long way in helping achieve that feeling too. A lot of the island is accompanied by sounds of nature with very little music at all. At least at the start. As the game goes on and the tension rises, the music amps up to match the tone until you're battling raptors to the sounds of an electric guitar. Sure, some of the tracks are pretty silly, like this one used for the Dilophosaurus area. But for the most part it works. The death sounds are pretty chunky too. Wait, was that Wayne Knight? It all comes together to help create the sense that you are on your own. You're not completely alone, however. Not far from the start of the game, you're likely to encounter the first of these information kiosks. There's seven of them in all, one for each of the dinosaurs, and they are all presented by Dr. Robert Backer, a real-life paleontologist. The full motion video clips are very compressed, but it has a retro charm, and the information Backer provides is at least educational. The Triceratops head was huge and heavy, but perfectly balanced. It could whip its long horns in any direction. Triceratops had a strong bony frill that protected the neck, all around the frill were sharp edges. When it swung the frill, it was a deadly weapon. I sought out the lot of these kiosks because I wanted to hear what Backer had to say about the dinosaurs. Backer's biggest real-world claims to his fame are his theory that dinosaurs were warm-blooded, as posited in his non-fiction book The Dinosaur Heresies, and his fiction novel Raptor Red, a novel set in the Cretaceous period written from the perspective of a Utah raptor. His biggest claim to fame in relation to Jurassic Park, however, is his rivalry with Dr. Jack Horner, the principal consultant used by the filmmakers on their portrayal of the dinosaurs. That rivalry even made it into the films. At one point in Jurassic Park, the characters throw shade at Backer's book before the tour, and The Lost World even features a character based on him, Robert Burke, who dies gruesomely getting torn out of a waterfall by an enraged T-Rex. Backer, being the good sport he is, thought the character and his death were pretty funny. That rivalry is the reason why it just tickled me every time Backer appeared in this game. He and Horner have very divergent views about dinosaurs, and you can see Backer trying to sneak some of his own theories in. Tyrannosaurus rex had the strongest bite of any meat eater. Its forehead was four feet wide. The eyes in T-Rex faced directly forward. It had great depth perception. And correct some of the scientific inaccuracies made by the filmmakers too. Dilophs had big crests on their head, and maybe they had crests along the neck, too, like a lot of birds and lizards do. The animal with the best poison delivery system is the spitting cobra. Could some dinosaurs spit? Could be. The Velociraptor family has many species, all deadly. The one on the island is a giant called Utah Raptor. You can even catch him glancing at the script a couple of times as well. 
Some of these vignettes feel like the developers had to draw them out of backer like blood from a stone though. Mainly the ones they just full on made up. These kiosks don't just serve the function of educating the player on the dinosaurs, they actually include hints on how to get past some of them. Which is fine in theory, but in order to do so they had to make shit up to conform to pre-designed game mechanics, like how the T-Rex has a pecking spot on its cheek, a not so subtle hint you're meant to shoot it in the head when you encounter it. T-Rex had a pecking spot right on the cheekbone where they'd try to bite or scratch in ritual combat. If you had a T-Rex you wanted to control, if you hit it real hard on the pecking spot, you might subdue it. And you can just feel Backer's eyes rolling out of his head and across the floor and out the door and down the street every time he's made to say these made up things. And I don't blame him. It might serve the game mechanics, but it also brings everything else the kiosks claim into question. There might have been a way around it, but as it is presented in the game overall, it just feels dishonest. I don't blame Backer for that though. He did his best with what he was given. There are some modern bird species that try to sneak their eggs into another mother's nest. If the mother detects these sneaky eggs, she can roll them out of her nest, and that could have happened with the dinos. Aside from Backer's short presentations, I love these kiosks for how clunkily they're edited. Like how when Backer finishes his vignettes, it always cuts awkwardly to a close-up of a dinosaur's face. I don't know why, but the kiosks gave me the impression I was looking at some sort of dino dating app, with Backer trying to talk up each animal, like those old terrible possibly fake dating service videos you can find around the internet. Complete with very unflattering profile pictures. Gargantuan top? Yeah, I bet she is. Aside from Backer, once you reach the control room of the visitor center, you're able to make contact with your control for this mission, Emily Shimura. We were worried when our telemetry showed that your helicopter crashed. But as long as you're not hurt, keep going. We're pulling you out as soon as you've got at least one egg from each dinosaur species in the incubator. I'll check on you again in a couple of hours. Oh, and uh, by the way, good luck. I love these FMV cinematics. I kept playing the game just to get more of them. Yeah, they're campy, I know this. Just like all these old Sega CD FMV games like Corpse Killer and Double Shift. But they're earnest, and the actors are obviously having a lot of fun. Dr. Harding also told her not to honk the cheap horn at the Triceratops set. Said it drives them nuts! It's also nice to just have actual characters to get invested in for a change, instead of a pixelated portrait of a film still, or a little Lego homunculus. The presence of Backer and Shimura doesn't lessen that sense of isolation though, if anything they heighten it. Backer is just a recording found in the kiosks around the park, as long gone as everyone else who once worked here. And the only place on the island you can talk to Shimura is through the control room in the visitor center, and even then she's always distant, safe and very far away on the mainland. Once you leave the room, you're back on your own, alone with the dinosaurs. But not forever. Emily Shimura serves two purposes. The first is to give you hints about how to acquire some of the more challenging dinosaur eggs. The other is to advance the plot. As time passes, it becomes clearer and clearer that you didn't end up on the island by accident. Your helicopter was sabotaged by none other than Biosyn, and now they're on their way to the island to grab as many dinosaur eggs as they can after the disastrous events of the film. Good old Biosyn. The company and its shady representative, Lewis Dodson, are one of the few plot threads left hanging by both the original book and the original film. In both iterations, Dodson hires Nedry to portray Hammond and steal dinosaur embryos for him, which is one of the many factors that leads to the implosion of the park systems during the events of the story. Dodson was cleaned up by Sarah Harding and a T-Rex in the book version of The Lost World, but him and his company have been conspicuously ignored by the film canon, at least until Dominion brought Dodson back to be the author of All Our Pain. And perhaps that's why Biosyn is a plot point Jurassic Park expanded universe materials have absolutely reveled in. You are going to be hearing about them several more times before this retrospective is done. There was even an unproduced Jurassic Park cartoon that would have featured a rival dinosaur park built by Biosyn in South America. They are the devil to InGen's angel. After all, it's right in the name. I know writers who use subtext and they're all cowards. The game's carefully constructed atmosphere of isolation is shattered the second you learn Biosyn is on the way. You might be alone on Isla Nubla, but you won't be for much longer. They already tried to kill you once, and they even shoot down another helicopter sent to rescue you too. The threat of their arrival is smothering, even if their representative is... uh... not. Nice of you to join me. I represent... Well, I guess it doesn't matter who I represent now, does it? Our people will arrive on the island in three hours. And we're after the same thing you are, so just stay in the visitor center. It should only take us about 30 minutes to complete our work. We don't want to hurt you. But if you get between us and those dinosaur eggs, well, I couldn't guarantee your safety. Just leave the eggs alone. 
and stay out of our way. I love this guy's performance. He is having the time of his life, and it pains me so much that this is his only appearance in the game, as far as I could find anyway. Why couldn't they get this guy to play Dodson in Dominion? The news that Biosyn is on the warpath changes the mood of the game. Beforehand you could take your time exploring the island and collecting the eggs. Now it's a race. Now you have a potential escape in Biosyn's own helicopter. But you need to finish collecting the eggs first. Which brings me finally to the gameplay. I really wanted to love this game. I really did. Everything I've spoken about so far have been aspects of it that I have loved. That's why I've been gushing over them so much. But I just can't get over the gameplay. This is a classic point-and-click adventure in every sense of the word. The amount of trial and error required to get through this game without a walkthrough is something I do not have the patience for. I really don't understand how you're expected to figure out some of the things you're meant to do to succeed. For example, did you know you're supposed to shoot this poor, innocent, defenseless, lovely, sweet frog? This is one of the more esoteric things the game expects you to do that I actually figured out myself on my blind playthrough. I wasn't even trying to see if it would progress the game, I was just farting about with a zapper. I figured out you can get this tree branch from this tree and give it to the baby Triceratops as well, but I was never able to find a way to open this already opened box. Most of the progress I made on my blind playthrough was by complete accident. Of the seven types of dinosaur eggs you need to collect, I was only able to find three. I figured out you could honk the horn of this crashed jeep, but the Triceratops always killed me. The game outright told me that I needed to use the Brachiosaur kiosk to play a juvenile's call and access their eggs, but I could never find the CD needed to turn it on. I managed to get into the T-Rex paddock, but not past this door. I found the entrance to the raptor nest, but was never able to get in. I got into the incubation chamber and stumbled onto the motion tracker, but never found the keycard to access the other section of the visitor's centre. I had all the pieces in front of me, I just couldn't put the puzzle together, no matter how hard I tried. The only areas I managed to complete were the Dilophosaur and Gallimimus routes, and it was only the Dilophosaur one I figured out without issue. The Gallimimus route I only half completed before stumbling into the second half at the last minute by accidentally shooting this poor, innocent, defenseless, lovely, sweet frog. This has a lot to do with the way the game handles clickable objects. If you can interact with something without needing an item, the cursor will change when you hover over it. A looking glass will bring you in for a closer look, a hand will either open something or pick something up, and an arrow will take you to another area of the park, all well and good. If something requires an item to be accessed instead of a hand, a little green X will appear, but it will only do that if you have the required item in your inventory. If you haven't picked it up, the cursor will remain a white plus sign as you hover over the area. I sort of understand the design decision there, but for the most part during my blind playthrough, I just thought it meant all these things couldn't be interacted with at all, and left. It's already really hard to pick out things you can click on in the background and things you can't, especially when the click boxes are so small for some of them. Some things are fairly obviously meant to be clicked on, but some things are very well hidden amongst the background, and others look like they should be obviously clickable, but either aren't, or require an item you don't have yet to use. It was so frustrating. It was only halfway through when I started noticing green X's where they hadn't appeared before that I realised it was related to what items you had in your inventory. It was only slightly earlier than that that I realised the game was on a very strict timer. The game says you have 12 real-time hours to collect the eggs and escape, which, if you remain on the first screen of the game, you actually do. Move anywhere, however, and that timer goes down by 10 minutes, meaning you can lose entire hours just travelling between different areas of the park. The only places where it doesn't cut down by 10 minutes per screen transition are inside the visitor centre and inside the raptor infested cave up in the mountain. Just about everywhere else you travel will cost you 10 minutes on the timer, which cuts 12 hours way way down to a more frantic 2. And this is only exacerbated by the fact you need to unlock every door with a keycard every time you use them. Let me just be very clear right now. I hate these kinds of mechanics in games. Take Dead Rising, for example. Everything I've seen of that game, I have absolutely loved. The style, the story, the setting, all of it. I love it. But it's a game I will never complete because of the time limit mechanic. And I've tried, multiple times over the better course of a decade. I just can't get past that aspect of the game. It's too stressful for me trying to time everything perfectly. The same is true of this game. I only completed it for the sake of this video, and even then, like I've stated before, I had to use a walkthrough. I'll admit, the 10 minutes lost at every screen transition does give the island a sense of scale. The place is big, it takes ages to get anywhere, and the game isn't shy about showing that off too. But for a point-and-click adventure built around trial and error, the time constraints just ruin it for me. There is no way to play this game in one sitting if you go in blind. My first playthrough ran out the clock completely, but my second guided playthrough still ended with only a couple of hours to spare. 
That was partly my fault, I'll admit. I wrote a couple of sections of the walkthrough too fast, and accidentally skipped over a necessary item or two. But even if I hadn't flubbed the perfect run, I don't think I would have made it to the end with too much more time to spare. The game does have an actual save system which mitigates this criticism somewhat, but you can only ever have one save file at a time, and you can accidentally screw yourself over if you save at the wrong time without already having everything you need to progress. Saving takes time, too. There's only one room in the game where you can save, and it's the control room of the visitor center, which, like I've already stated, is also the only place to view Shimura's messages. You always know when you've got a new one thanks to this handy icon in the top left corner, but you can't access them until you're in this room, which means if you're out in the middle of nowhere, it can cost you up to 30 or 40 or even 50 minutes of time trekking back to see what she has to say next. The time loss sneaks up on you. It doesn't seem like much at first, but it flies by if you're not paying attention, or if you're stuck, which you will be a lot if you're not following a guide, and sometimes even if you are. <laughs> this game relies heavily on adventure game logic for several of its sections. It does try to give you hints in the info kiosks and in Shimura's messages, but the former can be difficult to pass from the genuinely educational content backer is trying his damnedest to present and the latter can sometimes come in after you've already completed the section relevant to its information. The one most players are likely to come across earliest is the fact that eggs will die if you don't find somewhere safe to keep them quick enough. I found the incubator on my own in my blind playthrough, but not before losing several eggs, as presented by this icon in the bottom right. But it was only after finding the incubator myself that Shimura contacted me to inform me about it. This also happened in the second playthrough too. The only time she sent through a helpful message before I'd already completed the relevant objective was the video about the Brachiosaurs, and it was no help to me at all. I had no fucking clue what to do with this information. Some of it comes down to the inventory issue I mentioned before, like how you're meant to get this hanging backpack down by cutting a nearby rope hidden in the background, but there are some parts of the game that are so esoteric, I'm really not sure how you're meant to figure them out. Remember this triceratops that kept killing me because I kept honking the horn? Turns out what you're meant to do is honk the horn three times so that the triceratops charges it enough to dislodge all the items you need, then grab the injector off the ground and use it on the other triceratops nearby. How are you meant to figure that out? even with the helpful hint Shimura sends through. You'll probably be able to remember this code given in Muldoon's office when it comes up in the power shed. You might be able to figure out that you need to shoot this Gallimimus to get the Triceratops eggs after hearing Robert Backer talk about it at the kiosk too. You might even be able to figure out you can knock over this log to scare the Gallimimuses off through this hanging caution sign instead of wasting ammo zapping them down and cutting through the sign with the wire cutters, which was a nice moment of the game giving you multiple options through a section. But how are you meant to know this nest where you find the keycard to enter the visitor's center originally will contain and compy eggs after you come back to the area near the beach later on. How are you meant to know you have to save this gas gun for a fight with the T-Rex? How are you meant to know to shoot this poor, innocent, defenseless, lovely, sweet frog? Especially when shooting the Gallimimus on the other side of the river doesn't actually open up the path across. It's already frustrating. The time constraint just makes it worse. And I'm not just talking about the overall countdown. I'm talking about the parts of the game that are also timed. There are two in all, and appropriately enough they concern the two most dangerous dinosaurs on the island, the T-Rex and the Velociraptors. They are at least flagged pretty obviously, I'll give the game that. The raptor section starts the second you enter the cave, and the rex section starts as soon as you activate this door inside her paddock. Let's talk about the rex first. The door takes 30 seconds to open, and you need to fend off the Rex for the duration. As Backer told you in the kiosk while the game developers held him at gunpoint just off screen, you need to shoot the T-Rex in the cheek using the tranquilizer gun located in Dr. Wu's office. Hope you stocked up on extra ammo. You could try using the zapper, but it takes time to charge, and a single tap probably wouldn't distract the T-Rex at all. You actually have to save the gas gun you found in Muldoon's office for the very end of this section when the door finally opens. Shoot the Rex with the gas gun all three times and she'll rear up long enough for you to dart between her legs. Congratulations, you're only one third done. The second area of this section adds spitting Dilophosaurus to the equation. You need to open a grate off to the side, but the T-Rex is still coming. Not only that, you need to down the Dilophosaur blocking your way and it is very easy to fumble things when the T-Rex is on your tail. The last section of the Rex area is very similar to the example of the Triceratops and the Honking Horn I described earlier. It's in this area that you can collect the Rex eggs, then you need to escape by clicking this sewer grate at the right time to get the T-Rex to kick it open for you, but you can't actually escape. You need to get the Rex to back off, which means picking up this bear horn hidden on the other side of the background. It only has one charge too, which means if you use it before the Rex has kicked the grate open, you are fucked. 
Even with what little help the game gives you, how are you meant to figure any of this out? Especially when you're under pressure with the Rex breathing down your neck. If you'd already used the gas gun, or too much ammo for the tranquilizer gun, you have no option but to reload a save, or maybe even restart the entire game. The raptor section is slightly better, but it's also the section that almost ruined my guided run. The caves where the raptors keep their nests requires night vision goggles to even access, which you can find in the visitor center, but it also requires four big rocks to complete. Three can be found outside the cave and two are needed to even get inside. The fourth and final rock can be found inside the cave itself, hidden on the floor in the corner here. You need it and another rock to throw into this hole to raise the water and grab this key card. Even if the raptors hadn't been closing in at that point, I would not have had time to go back and get the other rock because it is, get this, on the first screen of the entire game, all the way back beside the crashed helicopter. That's right, you can potentially ruin your entire playthrough from the very first moments of the game if you don't happen to pass your cursor over this rock hidden in the background of the beach. Luckily I had an earlier save state and was able to go back and get it with time to spare. The rest of the raptor section isn't too bad, just a short shooting gallery where you have to hold them back while another door opens before you can grab the eggs and escape. I'll give the two sections this, they got my heart pumping, but for all the wrong reasons. I was more worried about fumbling the keys and having to do it again than I was exhilarated by the encounters with the dinosaurs. That said, the game does do something right in building up to the encounters with the Rex and the Raptors. You can get glimpses of the Rex earlier in the game. It may have even killed me once or twice while I was travelling through the Gallimimus paddock, I'm not sure. All I know is that the screen started shaking and then a few moments later I'd be dead. Thinking on it now, it might have just been the Gallimimus' stampeding. I'm not sure, I never figured out what it was. The appearance of the Rex and the Raptors feels special here, unlike the earlier games which just spammed them at times. Here, the rest of the time you're only going to encounter the more docile dinosaurs. Not that they aren't still dangerous. The Triceratops will run you down if you annoy them, and the Gallimimus will chase you if you grab their eggs in their presence. The Compies are just kind of here for a change, as are the Brachiosaurs, amusing as their vacant stares can be at times. Your most active formerly extinct enemies in the game are the Dilophosaurs, who will crawl around the underbrush and pop up to take pot shots at you in these shooting gallery sections. A good zap from the stun gun will drop them easily enough. They're not worth wasting tranquil ammo on, especially when you need as much of that as you can get, but for the most part the dinosaurs are content to leave you alone and exist in the background. I really like that the game just lets the dinosaurs be dinosaurs, which is something even the later films just started to forget about. They only attack you when you threaten them first, even the raptors are only defending their nest. They do look kind of silly when they run directly at the screen, or when the dilos fall over upon defeat, but it only adds to the campy charm. It's a simplified roster, but it works for what the game is. Any more dinosaurs to find and you'd have run out of time long before Biosyn arrived. And arrive they will, a couple of hours before the countdown runs out. The final objective of the game, once you deposit the last of the eggs in the incubator, is to head out to the Gallimimus paddock and steal Biosyn's helicopter to get home. They're not going to give it up without a fight though. They've left two guards to watch the helicopter by these old bones, and a third secret guard in the water, and then a fourth and final guard behind the bones again. It's odd, to say the least, to face down four random guys, one of whom is inexplicably diving in the river, as the final boss of a Jurassic Park game. There's something quietly horrifying about the idea of shooting these guys full of tranquilizer darts, even just one of which is strong enough to sedate a dinosaur, and then leaving them unconscious to die, but somehow it works. The game has been building up to this moment, and it delivers, as long as you can hit them, and have enough tranquilizer ammo, and enough time. In my first playthrough I just had too few seconds left to make it through the final boss. I always timed out. In my second playthrough I defeated the final enemy with my last dart. It is a hard fight at the end of a hard game. You really have to earn that 5 second ending cinematic. I knew you could do it. If anyone could get those eggs away from Biosyn, you were the one. Congratulations. I'll see you when you get back. And thanks. You get a different ending if you lose, and it's equally as short. What happened? Couldn't you stop them? Biosyn doesn't care how dangerous these dinosaurs are. They'll have them all over the planet in months. We may be next on the endangered species list. I cannot believe this game predicted the plot of Jurassic World Dominion. There's only one ending worth the effort, and it's the easiest one to get to. Grab this rock from the beach and use it on the computer in the control room, and it's curtains for Jurassic Park.
My favourite part of this ending is that it makes you sit through every scene transition out the door and down the stairs, despite the fact it's pre-rendered. They really don't make games like they used to. I'm so torn on this game. There's so much to love about it. The story, the atmosphere, the presentation, but the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay just isn't worth it because of how the trial and error adventure mechanics clash with the time constraint. It feels like a game torn between two eras. On the one hand, it's cutting edge and groundbreaking with its full motion video cinematics, a functioning save system, and use of an actual CD to play. On the other, it's archaic with its esoteric adventure game logic and time constraint mechanics. Which, when you think about it, reflects Jurassic Park pretty well, with its own flawed combination of cutting edge technology and prehistoric attractions. It's flawed, but it can still be fun. The same cannot be said of the next game. Before I begin this section, I just want to apologise if the game footage is a little bit crunchy here. I played the game in full screen, but OBS recorded it like this, so I've had to blow it up to fill the screen so it's not like you're watching it on a late 2000s phone. You might ask, why not just go back and re-record the footage? To which I say, I don't think you understand. I'm never playing this game again, not even to get extra footage for it. You couldn't pay me to play this game for another 10 seconds. Jurassic Park for the MS-DOS is Awful. Easily the worst game I've played for this retrospective so far, and easily the longest too. My playthrough clocked in at a monstrous 7 hours and 10 minutes, and every single one of them was agony. I need to vent about this game, so buckle up. You might be thinking, Monotom, you're not just gonna slap a full game critique into the middle of this retrospective. You fucking bet I am. Let's go. What set this game apart from all the others that I've played for this video is that I could not fall back on save states for this one. I played Jurassic Park for the home computer legitimately from start to finish, and it was truly one of the most infuriating experiences I've ever had with a video game in a long time. It's been a long while since I've encountered a game so invested in wasting your time, and I don't mean in the way some of the earlier games I've covered in this retrospective used their difficulty to mask a short runtime. Everything about this game is long. That's the word I'd use to describe it, long or tedious. Every level is drawn out, every objective is made into a slog. It's not even all that challenging, it's just long. Completing this game felt like swimming across an ocean, which is appropriate because it was developed by Ocean Software, the same company that made the NES and SNES versions. But I'll talk about them later. First I want to talk about my experience playing this abomination. I went into this game hoping it might be a distillation of everything I enjoyed about the SNES version. Instead this game is a bottle of port that's been left to go off in a cellar for 50 years. The cork has disintegrated, the liquid's gone rotten, and there's a sediment of god knows what sludge at the bottom just waiting for you to upturn the bottle and reveal itself. The game begins as abruptly as the others by Ocean Software. Just exchange the Jurassic Park gate for a crashed tour car. What is immediately apparent about this game is how goddamn beautiful it is. The sprite work in this game is gorgeous, even if Grant is missing his hat and looks kind of like a serial killer stalking his victim when moving southwest. <laughs> The backgrounds have the fidelity of the SNES adaptation combined with the variety of the NES game. Jurassic Park and its attractions have never looked this good. This game is just lovely to look at. As the true nature of the game revealed itself, this aspect of it was one of the few things that kept me playing. I wanted to see the game's interpretation of the park, and it delivered on that. Hats off to the artists, especially since they apparently had to redo the sprites many, many times before getting the green light of approval. Of course, once you get past how good the game looks, you have to contend with how the game plays. Mechanically this is almost the exact same game as both the NES and the SNES versions. The controls are just as tight and responsive, if not more so, and somehow, despite being made by a different team on a different continent, the off-center aiming problem persists. The biggest and really only difference in the controls is an absence of a jump button. Grant just hops up and down ledges automatically when you get near. You have the fewest defensive options out of all three ocean games so far too, with only two weapons at your disposal for the vast majority of the game. Those two weapons are the cattle prod and this gun. The cattle prod is your starting gear, just like in the SNES version, which might give the impression that it's not as good as the gun, which requires a pickup and has limited ammo. But that wasn't the case at all. In the SNES version, the cattle prod only discharged for as long as you held down the attack button, but in the PC version, it will shoot out however much charge it has, no matter what. At full charge, this was more than enough to kill or at least deter pretty much every enemy in the game. It can even go through walls and completely ignores projectiles, which the gun does not. If you're getting swarmed by Dilophosaurs, and at some point in this game, you are going to be swarmed by Dilophosaurs, then the bullet hell of Poison Spit is going to make shooting them with the gun next to impossible. The spit just eats the bullets and vice versa. 
Even worse, the Dilophosaurs can shoot off another gob of spit the instant their previous one is interrupted by anything, so trying to shoot the Dilophosaurs at close range with the gun can result in you potentially taking an absurd amount of damage at the cost of an absurd amount of ammo. It's just not worth it. The cattle prod might be a close range weapon, but it has a much wider reach and while it's discharging it will constantly damage anything it's touching, which is really useful given how every enemy in this game loves camping Grant's position to deal contact damage. It got to the point where I never even used the gun because it was so hard to hit anything with it. Like these stupid bugs, even if each bullet might do more damage than a moment's zap from the cattle prod. Even if it does do more damage, it still takes three clean shots to drop a Dilophosaur, the most common enemy in the game after the compies, compared to a couple of seconds with the cattle prod. Another point in the cattle prod's favour is that it can be used to move objects quickly at no cost, which will become very important as the game goes on. I never went out of my way to get the gun. Not that you'd ever need to. Ammo pickups for it are all over the place, and you can first find it within literally the opening moments of the game. The two weapons just do not compare. The only other gameplay addition of note is this very rudimentary inventory. It's not a terrible idea in principle, but it doesn't really serve a purpose. Inventory items you need to use on gates and doors, like keycards, are automatically used when you interact with these objects. You don't need to scroll through the inventory to get them, and there's no separate inventory for the weapons. Just think of cycling through your quick inventory to select your healing flasks in a Souls game, and you'll understand what I mean. Not that the problem here ever gets anywhere near as bad. The most items you'll ever have in your inventory is four, and overall the mechanic just feels left over from a different iteration of the game that had much more focus on this sort of gameplay loop. These aspects of the gameplay are all things you'll come to know across the course of the opening level. The developers throw you in the ocean and just expect you to swim, but there is an order to it. For the most part the level is large and open, with areas separated by these trees and rocks that you have to navigate through. But this opening section is actually quite linear. The T-Rex held you and the car into this pit, just like in the film, and the only way out is up these ledges. Not only does this teach the player that these small ledges can be traversed, but it forces you to travel by this motion sensor. As in the SNES game, you can interact with these things, but here they're a combination of the checkpoint poles that gave you your objectives found in the top-down exterior sections of that game, and the much more elaborate terminals found in the first-person indoor sections. It's here that you get your first objective, Rescue Tim and Lex. It's also your second objective, and your third, and your fourth. In fact, overall this game is spent rescuing Tim and Lex, which I'll get into detail a bit more later. These motion sensors also provide maps of the various dinosaur paddocks, with information on where to find all the places you need to go, which is great in theory, but in practice these maps are extremely unhelpful. Each of these levels are huge, and the maps never provide any kind of scale, nor indicate environmental obstacles like dense forest or cliffs. Even the map key has to be loaded on a separate screen from the map itself. About the only thing they're good for is giving a vague idea of where you are on the level by the position of the various motion sensors. I really like the way it gives a list of expected dinosaurs the same way the computer system in the book did. But the real reason the game pushes you to this motion sensor the second you start is because these things can open doors, and you need this one to open a door before you do anything else in the level. It can't open the paddock gate, that requires a keycard, but it can open the door to this bunker, which you will need to access if you want to rescue Lex. As for Tim, well, he's just hanging out with the dinosaurs. Finding him is simple enough. In fact, I'd be surprised if most players didn't just run into him while exploring the level. Finding Lex is another matter entirely. The level is huge, and it's hard at first to know what you can and can't pass through. You have to get to the bunker you unlocked at the motion sensor like I mentioned, and you can see where it is on the map, but the game makes you take such a roundabout way to reach it that knowing where it is really doesn't help. When I played the game for the first time, I thought maybe Lex is at the bunker and that's why I have to get to it. But no, instead there's just a toolbox. You can't even enter the bunker, you just travel up beneath the background into an empty black void. You need the tools to open this sewer grate in another ditch close to the level's start point, which I don't think is too hard to figure out if you've walked past it while exploring, given how few unique environments elements there are in this map. Head inside, and so begins the first FPS section of the game. Oh, I'm just joking. The sewer looks like this. Not as impressive, is it? At least the music's pretty good. It's this sewer section that sets the tone for the rest of the game. The opening area of the T-Rex paddock seems big at first glance, but it can actually be completed quite quickly. The sewer cannot be completed quickly. It cannot be rushed. It sets its own pace and holds you to it from beginning to end. Like practically every section of this game, it is a maze filled with trash mobs that only really exist to get in your way. There are a couple of bigger dangers. These flying things can kill you pretty quickly if you get swarmed, and these giant crocodiles can one-shot you if you linger in the water too long. 
long. But for the most part, the challenge is just figuring out where to go and what to do in order to complete the level, and it does not believe in holding your hand. In fact, it goes out of its way to make it as difficult as possible. Case in point, the keycard needed to exit the T-Rex paddock and complete the level is located right at the start of the sewer section. The first time I played through this, I found the card very quickly following the left wall, and I thought, no, that can't be it, surely. No way would an area this big be put into the game with only a keycard to find right at the very start. In the film, Lex is left to shelter in a sewer pipe after the T-Rex attack while Grant goes to rescue Tim from the tour car in the tree. I just realised how strange that sentence sounds out of context if you've never seen the movie. Anyway, so I thought maybe she'd be hiding somewhere in the sewer in this game too. I searched all over this level for Lex, certain she must be somewhere in here. I got killed multiple times, I even game over trying to find her in this maze, but I never did. The most I found was this box and the occasional health pickup. I even left and went back to search the T-Rex paddock too. I spent so long searching I thought, well, maybe I was wrong about her being in here. Maybe in having found Tim, I'd also found Lex, like a party in an old school RPG all merging under the same sprite. I even tried to leave with just Tim after getting the keycard, but no. The game wouldn't let me leave without Lex. This is the exact moment I decided, fuck it, I'm using a walkthrough. Otherwise I'm going to be here forever. And this game is already getting on my nerves. Turns out I was right in thinking Lex is somewhere in the sewer. As far from the entrance as possible, of course. In an out of the way section all the way up in the top right. What I didn't expect is that it's not enough just to find her and bring her back to the entrance like you can with Tim. Remember that movable box on the very far left of the map? You have to push that through the sewer all the way to Lex for her to climb a board, then push it all the way back to the entrance for her to leave. This is what I mean about the game being so invested in wasting your time. And this is only the start. True, once you find both her and the box, it's not a stretch to intuit you have to bring them together, given you can move the latter and not the former. But it's such a long way that even if you know what you're doing and where to go, it's still going to take ages, especially with how slowly Grant pushes the box. And that's not even taking into account you still have to avoid the enemies present in the sewer. The crocodiles can one-shot you, like I mentioned before, and though sometimes the sound cue plays to indicate they're coming, most of the time they'll just rise up out of the water and kill you before you can react. There is a method to speed these sorts of sections up, one I mentioned when talking about the cattle prod. If you're in the right position, the cattle prod can send movable objects jetting across the screen for seconds at a time, allowing you to move through the many, many box puzzles at a reasonable speed, and kill any enemies that happen to spawn right in front of you as well. But it's not without its dangers. Because it's so hard to see oncoming corners and dead ends, it can be very easy to cattle prod the box into a position where you can't move it. As soon as any of these boxes or rocks are pushed flush against a solid object, they cease to be movable and instead become ledges. It is possible to unstuck them using the cattle prod, but it takes time and is very fiddly. There were a couple of times while I was trying to push the box to Lex that I just had to reset the section by leaving because it got stuck at an angle where I couldn't prod it free. It even happened once on the return trip, but no way was I going to reset the section again after all the effort I went to to get to Lex in the first place. I brute forced this section, I just wanted it to be over, and I still got so lost trying to find the exit that I took Lex right back to the box's starting position before I got anywhere near to getting her out of the sewer. After that, all that was left to do was take both kids to the exit gate, only to find I didn't have the keycard, which meant one last very frustrated trek back to the sewer to get it. It wasn't like I hadn't picked it up before when trying to find Lex, but the inventory resets when you die, and I'd been munched by a crocodile trying to get the box across the sewer. It was just one last dollop of tedium on the pile that is the first level. I was hoping it might just be a poor start. Level 2 disavowed me of that notion. The second mission begins with Grant alone. Lex and Tim are gone, having run across a bridge that collapsed behind them between levels. It's jarring to say the least, and a bit crap that you have to learn what happened from the nearby motion sensor rather than seeing it happen in game. It's not like the game can't do it. There are other instances later on where Tim and Lex will run off in a scripted event, but here there's nothing. The motion sensor also informs you that in order to reach them, you're going to have to take a long detour through not only the Triceratops paddock, but the Stegosaurus paddock beside it, and the underground tunnels connecting the two. The second level actually only covers the Triceratops paddock, and the route through it is fairly simple and pretty short overall, but that doesn't mean it's over quickly. Far from it. About halfway through the level you'll come across a tall, narrow valley you have to run down chased by a very angry Triceratops. The Triceratops is faster than you, just like every dinosaur in the game, and there's no space in the valley to avoid it. Nor can it be stalled by weapons, the only way to get past it is to collect these clumps of berries found all over the level. The more you collect, the longer it will stop the Triceratops in the valley, so you don't need absolutely all of them, but you do need at least three quarters in my experience. 
which still translates to a lot of collecting, because these things are spread thin across the entire map, and each one only fills up a tiny sliver of the bar. Needing to go through the motions of collecting these berries every time I died later in the level sucked. It's not even like it's challenging since the berries are always in the same place every time you play. It's just tedious. It's an objective that only exists to waste your time. If you get frustrated and try to rush it, you'll probably just have to do it all over again anyway, because you won't collect enough to progress like I did. I got so frustrated at having to do this over and over again that I actually had to step away from the game for a couple of hours. It's like those levels in Hitman Codename 47, another game I previously covered, that make you walk for several minutes in order to even re-attempt the challenging part of the mission. Because the second half of this level is challenging, and for all the wrong reasons too. Not far from the narrow valley with the Triceratops is a second valley with a second Triceratops. You can't run away from this one, instead you have to kite it into charging this conspicuous wall of stones in order to knock them down and escape. It takes 10 clean hits for the Triceratops to knock the wall down, but the game won't let you cheese it by running from side to side. The Triceratops has to hit the wall dead center, or the game won't count it. And you can't stay in the center and run when the Triceratops starts to charge either, because just to add insult to injury, the developers added this Dilophosaur up on a cliff to take pot shots at you while you're trying to bust the wall down. This thing cannot be killed, and even though its spit doesn't do that much damage, it adds up over time. And sometimes the Triceratops will just rubber band onto you and hit you anyway. But the absolute worst part of this fight is that the Triceratops can still kill you once the wall has been knocked down, if you're too slow. Since it will keep charging you no matter what, it's awful, made so much worse by the knowledge that if you fail, you'll have to go collect berries for five minutes just for the chance to try again. When I first played through this level I thought, oh that's cool, when I came across this dead Triceratops, and when I found the other tour car, and the destroyed bathroom where Gennaro died in the film. But the last time I came through this level the charm was tarnished. I never wanted to see this bathroom again. Thankfully, once you pass the second Triceratops, the level is effectively over. Just grab this keycard and you can head through to the level exit. My hope that the tedium of the first level had been a one-off was completely shattered by the time I finished the second. Going into the third mission, I knew exactly what kind of game I was playing. I just had no idea the depths to which it was yet to sink. The third mission begins in the underground bunker between the Triceratops and the Stegosaurus paddocks, in what genuinely is the first first-person shooter section of the game. It is a welcome change of pace, but it's also pretty boring. There are no enemies in the bunker, at least none that I could find. There are no puzzles you need to complete in order to unlock the exit either. You just hold forward until it's over. Once you know where you're going, it's nothing but a wasted two minutes on your way to start the actual level. And what a level it is. This game has no best level. At most you can say it has a least worst level, and that's the fourth missions for reasons I'll get into once we reach it. Level 3, however, has to be a contender for the worst in the game. It's a real toss up between this and the final section of the game, because while the game's final chapter is so bad I actually dissociated through most of it, level 3 made me angry, furious even. Not because it was long and tedious, although it was those things, but because it was challenging for all the wrong reasons. I haven't spoken about the game's many, many trash mobs yet because I wanted to save that discussion for here. The most common one you'll encounter are the compies, but there are also the trilobites in the sewer section, these small pterodactyls encountered throughout the game, and their bigger sisters here in level 3. These enemies never, and I truly mean never, stop spawning. If you kill any of them within sight of their spawn point, they will instantly pop back up, even if you're standing on top of it. You have three compies spawn in, zap them, then immediately have three more to replace them. The compies always spawn out of walls and trees, as close as the game can get to hiding them behind an object when they appear. Which means if you happen to be passing close to these things, you run the risk of getting hit as the enemies spawn in. The bugs in the sewer just materialize out of the ground, even if you happen to be walking on them. The flies are the absolute worst though, because they will just zoom in from off screen and swarm you until you zap them back into extinction. None of these enemies are particularly dangerous, none of them hit for much damage, and none of them take much of a zap to kill. In fact, the bugs and compies will melt in front of your cattle prod if you actually bother to turn it on them. Their threat comes from their sheer numbers, but the same isn't true of the flyers. The threat the flyers pose comes from their position on the vertical axis. Because of the angle of the top-down camera, you can never be sure how high they are in relation to Grant. Sometimes they'll just pass right over him, and others they'll camp his position stacking contact damage because they can easily match his movement speed. They can pack a punch this way too, and usually they'll get away with it since the cattle prod can't actually touch them if they're on Grant's exact position. This made them the most annoying enemies in the game, and nowhere was that truer than level 3. Level 3, for the most part, takes place in the Stegosaurus paddock, a series of narrow cliffside passages with very few large open areas, which makes dodging the swarms of trash mobs next to impossible. 
I sometimes got hit literally within a second of starting the level because a flying enemy would appear before the mission had even finished loading in and hit me before I was allowed to move ground out of the way. This isn't the only way that level 3 forces you to take unavoidable damage. The stegosaurs found throughout the level are always positioned along narrow walkways that make avoiding their swinging spiked tails impossible. If you have to pass them, and you will have to pass all of them, usually multiple times, you're getting hit. They move too quickly to be avoided, and those spiked tails don't do chump change damage like the trash mobs either. They will wear your health down real fast. And that's not even taking the boulders into account. I swear these things are unavoidable. There are so many bouncing around that can hit you, it slows the game down the same way being around too many dinosaurs does. The sheer volume of boulders taking up the screen makes it easy sometimes to miss the ones that fly in like a lightning strike and hit Grant before you have any chance to dodge. There are so many rocks bouncing all over the place that it makes dodging them difficult, but it is doable to an extent. These ones you just can't. Grant just has to eat those boulders and you just have to deal with the unavoidable damage. They're not present throughout the entire level, but they're insidiously positioned in places that you have to cross multiple times, like these stairs, most of which are too high for Grant to reach from ground level. The only way to traverse them is to collect a box from somewhere nearby and push them down alongside the stairs in order to make the jump. You can accidentally push the boxes off the cliffs too, by the way, though at least they'll respawn. You can accidentally walk off the cliffs as well, which is really shit. The fall damage in this game is crap, because most of the time it's next to impossible to tell how high a drop is due to the way the camera is positioned, but even then a short fall will easily kill you. Oh, that was barely a trip, how are you dead? Now combine all of these things with the fact that level 3, sorry, the only part of level 3 that actually matters, is nothing but one protracted gauntlet of box puzzles, and you can understand why I hate it so much. This is the first level where the health bar actually mattered, made much worse by the fact that it's so stingy with health packs. You have only two or three to get you through the entire gauntlet. It's so awful. And some of these box puzzles are so low effort they might as well not be here. They only exist to waste your time so you're forced to take damage from the hail of boulders or flying dinosaurs. The only part of the gauntlet that's actually stimulating as a puzzle is this section right at the end where you have to stack two boxes on top of each other and drop a third down beside them to make a short staircase to climb down an otherwise lethal cliff. Hearing me bitch or watching me play it really doesn't do this level justice. You really have to experience it yourself to understand just how shit it is. I wasn't even relieved when I finally found Lex and Tim on this bridge at the end of the level. I was just tired. Thankfully the next level was nowhere near as exhausting. But that's not to say it was good. I called it the least worst level before, and that's still true, but it's only because it's comparatively short. There are no bunches of berries to collect, or worthless box puzzles to complete. Well, almost. But that doesn't mean it's free of its fair share of bullshit. The level starts in the Gallimimus paddock, a refreshing green compared to the sea of yellow rocks of the previous mission. Unfortunately, the terrain is the same mess of hard to judge cliffs that can send you to your death if you're not careful. You start the mission out escorting Lex and Tim. I worried when I first played this game that it would be one protracted escort mission, and in some respects it is, but the developers at least had the sense to make the kids invincible. True, I don't think the filmmakers would have allowed the two children to be eaten by dinosaurs in one of the video game tie-ins to their mega blockbuster hit, but mechanically this is a huge relief. The game is hard enough without having to micromanage the kids. That said, I was surprised at how little time you actually spend with them though. About 5 seconds into level 4 they've run off again, into this bunker which immediately shuts behind them. The nearby motion sensor tells you the door is busted, and the exit is on the other side of the paddock, which once again means Grant's taking the long way around. <sighs> Here we go again. Turns out the kids actually had a pretty good reason to run away this time. A Gallimimus stampede that Grant blunders right into not far from the motion sensor. The Gallimimus are big, but just like the baby Triceratopses from earlier levels, they don't hit very hard, and a good zap from the cattle prod will put them down quick enough. Turns out the Gallimimus has had a pretty good reason to stampede too, since it's not long before the T-Rex appears in this narrow valley. Like the Triceratops before, the Rex is invincible and much much faster than Grant. The only way to hold her back long enough to escape is to use the game's elusive third weapon, the Road Flares. Their only function is to slow the T-Rex down, and this is their only appearance too. You have to be quick in throwing them as well. The Rex doesn't mess about. At least dying to the Rex is funny, and surprisingly gory too. So gory Nintendo actually demanded they tone it down for the SNES version. <laughs> Wait, was that Wayne Knight again? This would be one of the game's better set pieces if it wasn't secretly pulling a fast one on you. At the end of the valley is an instant death trap, one you have no hope of avoiding if you haven't already done some prep work earlier in the level. 
There's a small ditch at the end of this valley that is too tall for Grant to escape should he fall in. You need to find this barrel up on the cliffs at the start of the map and push it down into the ditch in order to pass it by. And it needs to be in the ditch too, you can't just push it off the cliff, you have to aim it despite not being able to see what you're trying to throw it into. Even if you do all that, you still need to throw the last road flare onto the broken barrel to set the oil alight and ward the T-Rex off, otherwise you're dead meat. This isn't the first time the game has pulled this kind of bullshit, but this is the point where they start to become more insidious about it. Going forward, the player traps can sometimes require preparation levels in advance, and the game feels no need to warn you that they're coming. They come at you like a slap, and usually result in either an unreasonable amount of backtracking, or an outright death. I talked in my Hitman Codename 47 video about how I hate this sort of trial and error gameplay in titles that don't feature proper save systems, and that is no less true here. This isn't good game design, it's just frustrating, especially when there's no certainty you'll succeed, even if you know what you're doing. And this encounter with the T-Rex is one of the least egregious examples. It's not even the only one in this level either. Once you escape the T-Rex, the rest of this section is an afterthought. You need to find a keycard to let Tim and Rex out of this bunker, but that's it. The rest of level 4 takes place in and around the Dilophosaur paddock, and would you look at that? We finally reached the iconic gate. It can't be opened of course. You need Dennis Nedry's keycard to unlock it, as the nearby motion sensor tells you, and getting it is easier said than done. Tim and Lex are setting this one out. Grant's on his own for this one. The rest of level 4 and the entireties of levels 5 and 6 take place in the same general area of the park, which I really like in concept, but in practice it really outstays its welcome. You start out in the Dilophosaur paddock on the north side of the river, travel across the top of the aviary, do a loop of the Brachiosaur paddock, travel back across the bottom of the aviary, traverse the Dilophosaur paddock again on the south side of the river, then travel the aviary for a third time by boat, do another loop of the Brachiosaur paddock from the water, and finally make your way through the Dilophosaur paddock again before returning to the park's main gate in order to reach the visitor center and your goal. It is a long trip, and it really brings into focus the problems with the password system. This isn't like the Genesis game where each level was marked clearly on the map, was self-contained, and had its own associated password. This game overall treats the park more like one big interconnected environment, not quite an open world like the SNES game, or even something like a Metroidvania, but there's an attempt in the level design to create some sort of cohesive whole, like you'd find in a real world location, rather than the abstract representation of a place common in video games at this time. It's not even like you're really backtracking through these areas, because even though you travel through them multiple times, you actually don't travel through the same parts. You can catch glimpses of places you're going to and places you've already been, but generally you can't access them depending on what part of the level you're playing through. It's very different from the first third of the game, where you only went through each paddock once, and therefore it was much easier for the developers to divide them up as levels with associated passwords. And because of that, for the first third of the game it wasn't a huge problem. There was the nothing first person section at the start of level 3, but that was really the only stumble. From this point on though, the levels get longer and longer, and the game gives out passwords at increasingly irregular intervals. Level 5 encompasses two separate trips through the aviary, on top of sections set in the Brachiosaur and Dilophosaur paddocks alone, and level 6, while shorter overall, covers nearly as much ground. The game gets better about handing them out more often in the last third of the game, but it also starts handing them out arbitrarily with very little consideration given to where you actually are when they pop up. Not to mention one of them is rendered completely useless by the fact reloading a level resets your inventory in the same way dying does, as I'll get into later. Overall it just feels like very little thought was put in to dividing the game up into levels once it stopped being a straight journey through the park and started playing around with non-linear map design. That non-linear map design makes talking about this section of the game very tedious. In an earlier draft I started a play-by-play -play of every individual section, but it just went on for pages and pages and pages of script, and most of it boiled down to, you go forward until you find the level exit. Which is true. There's very little you actually have to do in these sections other than press on. There's the odd keycard to find amongst a clutch of eggs, the odd door to unlock through a motion sensor, the odd box puzzle to complete or bridge to extend, but overall it's just a boring slog, made worse by the fact you travel through each area two or three times. The only interesting one to look at is the aviary, but it's also the most frustrating to play because of the presence of the flying enemies. At least you can skip most of the second trip through it by using this box to jump over this wall. To cut a very long and very tedious story short, the first zigzagging loop of the various paddocks is in service of getting to a raft at the end of this labyrinth, at the end of the Dilophosaur paddock, in order to reach a motion sensor in the Brachiosaur paddock that is, for some bizarre reason, located on an island in the middle of the river. I actually quite enjoyed the raft section, short though it was overall. It moved so fast the ichthyosaurs posed basically no threat, and it was a welcome change of pace after dealing with Grant's plodding movement speed through the rest of the game. 
Sure, the game tries to lure you into a trap with this waterfall in the aviary, and you don't automatically jump aboard when you find it, you have to swim to it, which I wasn't aware you had to do the first time I got to it, but overall I enjoyed it, if only because it was unique. Much stranger is your objective to recover the embryo stolen by Nedry located in the Brachiosaur paddock. It's here that you can find Nedry's crashed jeep, too, and the embryos he died attempting to steal strewn across the ground, which you are instructed to collect before continuing on by a nearby motion sensor. You have to do it quickly, too, because the door to the aviary you unlock from the motion sensor will only remain open for the next minute, and if you miss that window, you'll have to do a loop of the entire level just to get back to the terminal and unlock it again. The ridiculous thing is, you shouldn't actually collect the embryos right now, despite the game's implication at the terminal that you have to, because if you happen to die after this point in level 5, your inventory will just reset, and you won't return to the Brachiosaur paddock until level 6, after you've got the raft. It's bizarre, I don't know why it's like this. The only other bit worth talking about in this entire long-winded section of the game is this walk along the northern edge of the river in the Dilophosaur paddock at the start. It's such a narrow temperamental bit of level geometry, it almost felt like I was glitching out of bounds the first time I passed it, especially with this bit where you have no choice but to walk out over the water. But no, this is the way you're expected to go. I got across it fine the first time too, until a fucking compy spawn killed me right at the end of the level. I didn't do so well the second time, I would have had to redo the Gallimimus paddock too if I'd failed a third time, but thankfully I didn't. But eventually, it ends. After going through the Dilophosaur paddock, and then the aviary, and then the Brachiosaur paddock, and then the aviary again, and then the Dilophosaur paddock again, and then the aviary again again, and then the Brachiosaur paddock again, and then the Dilophosaur paddock again, again, you finally make your way back to the main gate and reunite with Lex and Tim. With Nedry's keycard you're able to open the gate and finally escape to the safety of the visitor center. You have finally exited Jurassic Park. You will never see any of these dinosaurs again. Which is kind of bittersweet honestly. Sure, the vast majority of them were were insufferable in terms of gameplay, but in terms of presentation they were great. The T-Rex and the Triceratops might still be the same fundamental sprite as in the NES and SNES versions, but they have never looked better. The massive dinosaurs overall were a highlight. The massive stegosaurs, the giant pteranodons that drop rocks in the aviary but are otherwise pretty harmless, the huge stampeding gallimimuses and the baby triceratopses, the ichthyosaurs and the brachiosaurs in the river, they may vary wildly in size from reality and even the scale the game is trying to adhere to, but they looked so good I usually didn't care. I almost wish they'd been used more more, a double-edged sword of a wish, I know, but they're all used so infrequently that the roster of enemies feels tiny, despite how many dinosaurs there actually are. The T-Rex appears exactly once in the entire game. So do the Gallimimuses and Stegosaurs and adult Triceratopses. The Ichthyosaurs, Brachiosaurs and giant Pteranodons appear multiple times, but that's only because you travel through that section of the park multiple times in levels 5 and 6. Whereas the smaller dinosaurs, like the Compies, the Dilophosaurs, and the smaller Pterodactyls, are just everywhere. They never stop appearing. There are a couple of levels that have unique smaller enemies, like these annoying bugs, sure, but for the most part the game feels like it only has three overall, the Compies, the Dilophosaurs, and the Flyers, and none of them were mechanically engaging the fight. They were just annoying, and there were usually so many there was just no point in fighting them. Eventually I just started ignoring them unless they got in the way. True, the NES game and the Sega Genesis game also had about three or so enemies spread thick across the entire game, but both of those titles only took a couple of hours to complete each. Jurassic Park for the personal computer lasted over seven hours, and the lack of common enemy variety had worn thin by the end of the first level. Taken as a whole, the roster of dinosaurs has a decent amount of variety, but the way the game uses them too much, or not at all, was awful. The developers used the greater power of the PC to create larger swarms of dinosaurs than was ever possible in the console titles, but they never once stopped to consider how that might affect gameplay. True, if there were fewer dinosaurs most of the game would just be spent walking from place to place because the maps are so big, but the game just ended up being that anyway, just with more visual noise. Surprisingly, the only dinosaur they didn't overuse were the raptors. But that's about to change. Welcome to level 7. Looks a little different, doesn't it? From this point on, the game is a first-person shooter. It leaves a striking impression at first glance with the crunchy sprites depicting Hammond, Ellie, Lex and Tim, and the big 3D representation of the visitor center, despite the short draw distance. It even begins with a short cutscene with actual dialogue, which is really cool and a great change of pace until you realize you're going to have to sit through it every single time you reload from this password. And you're going to be reloading it a lot if the game runs like this, as it did for me. Yeah, this is really bad. I thought the interior sections of the SNES game were slow. I didn't know what slow was until I got to this part of the PC version. And the worst part is, I genuinely thought the game was meant to be like this. 
not just because of how slow the interior sections of the SNES game had been, although that was a factor, but also because I'd already had to troubleshoot the first two thirds of the game. The game initially launched with joystick control enabled, and for whatever reason that causes the game to slow to a crawl until you turn it off. Given how well the game ran after I did so, I figured it was running as intended. I tried, for 50 whole entire minutes, to complete the game with it running like this. It took me that long to step away from the game and even check if it was running properly, because I'm just that stubborn apparently. Playing the game like this is not impossible, but it's so close that it might as well be. You can't hold down the run button or you teleport across entire rooms, so I learned to sort of tap the forward key to keep myself moving. Eventually I sort of got the hang of it. I probably could have even completed the game like this if not for the new enemies. The game has shown admirable restraint in holding back the Velociraptors, but they are out here in force now, and they are impossible to deal with when the game is running at this speed. You always know they're coming, they have an associated musical cue that tells you when you've been spotted, but it really doesn't help you when you can't turn around. Each one could easily take me down a quarter of my health, and even more if I was unlucky, which basically made this room in particular impossible. There are up to five raptors waiting for you beyond this door. The most I got with the game running at this speed was four. That was the straw that broke the camel's back for me. After that I stopped the game and went to check if something was wrong. It took a little tweaking in the DOSBox config file, but eventually I got the game running as intended, and wow, that is much better. Looking back on it, I really don't understand why I didn't realise this sooner. Obviously a computer would be more powerful than a console, even in 1993, but whatever. We're here now. Let's keep going. This fix instantly transformed the last third of the game into my favourite part, for a couple of minutes anyway. This recreation of the visitor centre is so good and you have free run of it. You can visit the control room, you can visit the theatre from the start of the film too. You can even visit the atrium, though it's missing its iconic skeletons. The raptors are a lot easier to deal with as well, unsurprisingly. They look better too. As usual in this game, the artwork for them is amazing, even if they take about 8 shots each to kill from this shotgun, the fourth and final weapon you're given. It's a hit scan weapon. As long as the raptors are in front of you, you're pretty much guaranteed to hit them. It is extremely functional, but I wouldn't call it good. The novelty of blasting a raptor away with a shotgun like Muldoon during the climax of the book wears off real fast. Every single one of them is just so tanky, and there's so many of them that it's just not worth the effort. It's not too bad inside the visitor center at the start of this section, but once you head outside, and especially once you enter the maintenance shed, it just becomes a joke. How many of these things did you clone, John? It's quicker to just run past them since they're the only dinosaur in the game that can't actually keep up with you. Even if you get stunned when one hits you, it's easy to just get away from them regardless, because you're so fast. Once you get the hang of turning without using a mouse, they're a non-issue. You're able to rebind the keys too, so there's no danger of having to spread your hand across the whole board. Bunch them up together and you can literally play this game one-handed. By this point in the game, my investment was hanging by a thread. I was enjoying the first person section more because it was different from the top-down sections that came before it, than because it was better than them in any way. It was cool to explore the building beyond what we saw in the film, true, but that wasn't what kept me playing. What did was the game's attempt to actually adapt a significant portion of the film. The last third of this game is framed around getting to the maintenance shed to perform a system reboot. Just substitute Ellie and Muldoon for Grant because, you know, imagine playing as a girl in a video game. It does a really good job of recreating the environments from that section of the film and the route you take through them too. You have to travel through the visitor center and past the raptor pen outside in order to reach the maintenance shed. Once inside, you actually have to follow a pipe along the ceiling in order to reach the power box, just like Ellie does in the film. Hammond and Ellie are in constant contact with you giving you advice on where to go, and will outright tell you if you go the wrong way. This is great! In fact, one of the few things the game does right is that sense of journey on your escape from Jurassic Park. You start in the T-Rex paddock where the tour ended, and have to fight your way back to the visitor center tooth and claw while keeping Tim and Lake safe. There's an attempt by the game to create the park as a coherent interconnected space, so it doesn't feel like you're just traveling from level to level, it actually feels like you're making tangible progress. This game is one of the few to attempt adapting big set pieces directly from both the film and the book as well, like the T-Rex attack on the Gallimimus stampede and the process of restarting the power from the former, and the river chase, the aviary, the raptor nest, and the underground tunnels meant to give the park's employees quick access to every part of the island from the latter. It's a valiant effort, and with better gameplay it would capture the atmosphere of the source material really well. This isn't like the Genesis game, this does feel like Jurassic Park, it's just buried under mountains of bullshit. The only really big stumble I think it makes, at least in terms of atmosphere, is how Tim and Lex are constantly acting like absolute morons. In the manual and articles about the game, the developers speak about having to protect Lex and Tim because they're kids and sometimes they do stupid things. 
but I feel like this is an unfair assessment, especially in regard to Lex. In the film, the only really stupid thing she does is turn on a torch and attract the T-Rex when it is attacking the tour cars. The way she constantly screams isn't idiotic, it's a natural response to being in a dangerous situation. I would be screaming too if I was being menaced by a T-Rex or Velociraptors. Overall it just feels like the games did her a bit dirty, and Tim as well because he's generally pretty on top of things. But whatever, it's a nitpick. Otherwise, it's a valiant effort and with better gameplay it would capture the atmosphere of the source material really well. Which is why what should be a claustrophobic game of cat and mouse between you and the raptors in the maintenance shed becomes a matter of holding forward and following the straight line in the ceiling until you find the power box somewhere in the depths of the building. The walkthrough I used for this game basically ended at the start of the first person section because they claimed the game just tells you where to go and it's boring to play from this point anyway. They made the effort to list the rest of the passwords and then signed off. And you know what? They were absolutely right. This game does tell you exactly where to go from this point on, and it is boring. These first person environments are massive but the game doesn't want you to explore them, it wants you to follow a straight line right to the end, which is kind of a shame because a lot of effort obviously went into making them. Finding the power box is a relief, but it's definitely not a victory. Of course, now you have to get back out again, but the game doesn't want you going back the way you came. Ellie directs you to a network of tunnels under the maintenance shed that can bring you back to the visitor centre quickly, a real Hastings cutoff of a shortcut. You're going to need night vision goggles to get through them, but don't worry, because Hammond tells you they're somewhere in the maintenance shed. What do you mean, they're somewhere in the maintenance shed? That doesn't fucking help me, John! The building's fucking huge! It's so big they had to split it into separate areas. Somewhere in the maintenance shed? On which side of the fucking load zone, John? Spared no expense? How about you spare me your bullshit, you capitalist fuck, and just tell me where it is? Somewhere in the maintenance shed, fuck off. My boot is gonna be somewhere up your ass when I get back to the visitor's center. You deserve to be eaten alive by compies. You wanna know the best part? That somewhere turns out to be right next to the entrance of the maintenance shed. So if you don't pick up the goggles when you first arrive, and why would you when the game never bothers to tell you you're going to need them, or that they even exist at all, you're fucked. You're going to have to make the trek all the way back through the level, and that's if you know where they are. Do you know how many side rooms and dead ends there are in this building? Do you know how many extra raptors you're gonna have to go through? Somewhere in the maintenance shed, you might as well say Earth is somewhere in the Milky Way. It's so close to the entrance that it would actually be faster just to return to the visitor center and the end of the game by going back outside and retracing your steps past the raptor cage, but the game actually expects you to go through the maintenance shed to turn on the power, go through it again in reverse to pick up the goggles, and then do it a third time to reach the level exit! This is madness! It effectively makes the password for level 9 useless too, since you don't retain inventory when you die. It makes more sense just to reload at the start of the maintenance shed with the password for level 8 and grab the goggles on your way down. You have to have them too. The game will not let you through the caves without them. This is so scummy. It's actually giving the worst parts of Hitman Code Name 47 a run for their money, and I never believed in a million years I'd ever find a game more determined to waste your time than that. This was the straw that broke the camel's back for me. Somewhere in the maintenance shed I lost what little goodwill I still had for the game. It was late, I was tired, I just wanted it to be over. I had no patience left for this game and its bullshit. I had no interest left in playing the game as the developers intended. All I wanted was for the nightmare to end. My finger barely left the W key for the rest of my playthrough. The rest of the game isn't even worth talking about. It's just a maze of caves and tunnels leading back to the visitor's center. I don't even remember playing through this, but watching the footage back just leaves me feeling exhausted. And it just keeps going. It's awful. It's so easy to get turned around because everything looks the same, and even when you reach this big open cavern, it's hard to know you're meant to jump off a cliff to progress, given how that just kills you at every other point in the game. When you finally reach the visitor center, there's not even a final confrontation with the raptors or the T-Rex to contend with. You just reach the atrium, find the other survivors, and that's it. The end, I guess. There are some pieces of media that just feel forced together, where you can feel every little bit of frustration and spite that went into forcing them out the door. And this is one of those games, in a way the two Nintendo console versions weren't. The top-down exteriors and first-person interiors were integrated together much, much better in the SNES version than they are in the PC version. I joked about creative differences in the two halves of the game feeling like completely separate titles, but there it was a joke. Here it feels like a real problem. This really does feel like two separate games smashed 
smashed together and it does not work. In an article for The One magazine in 1993, one of the game's co-designers, Matt Wood, claims that the game went through several iterations before they settled on one they were happy with. And yeah, you can feel those iterations fighting each other as you play the game. Like the decision was made halfway into the development of a first-person shooter to switch to a top-down adventure game, but we've already gone to all the effort of making these first-person maps, so we have to include them somewhere. But we never got the chance to put in all the detail or objectives, so just make it a linear run through each of the maps and just shove this bunker section somewhere else in the game that doesn't fit with the last third. But now that we have switched focus onto a top-down shooter, we don't have the time to flesh out the mechanics. Steven Spielberg doesn't want jumping puzzles. We're not going to do many games. The filmmakers don't want it to be just a shooter. The American office isn't passing on their reference material. All you do is walk through each of the levels. Just add in box puzzles and collectathons. Draw the sprites again. Draw the sprites again. The sprites aren't good enough. Draw the sprites again. This is all conjecture, of course. I don't know how the development of the game actually went. All I have to go on are these articles written to talk it up. But that's how it feels playing it. These articles in CU Amiga and The One magazine actually provide images of things that never made it into the finished product. Take this baby T-Rex, nowhere to be found in the game. Or talk of this objective of healing a sick adult Triceratops while avoiding its defensive baby. There are pictures of raptors present in the top-down sections, pictures of the T-Rex actually present in the T-Rex paddock, and at different angles as well. There's a different version of the crashed tour car, and a picture of the giant pteranodon outside the aviary. The developers obviously had grand designs for this game, they just ran out of time, or ran out of money, or maybe they just wanted to be done with it. Oh god, one more page of script, I'm almost free! It should be noted that the developers of this game were not the same team behind the Nintendo versions. The two Nintendo console games were both made by Ocean's American branch, who had much easier access to the filmmakers and reference material, but the PC version was developed by a different group in England. The two teams probably started in the same place with the same ideas, but in the SNES game, the devs at Ocean Software somehow managed to capture lightning in a bottle, and make the top-down and first-person sections work in the same title. The team working on the PC version were nowhere near as successful, mainly due to how both sections are so poorly integrated with each other. Not only that, the team behind the SNES version had to work within the hardware limitations of the console, whereas the PC team felt pushed to make the game bigger and faster and better looking, something that was a selling point even back in the 90s. I don't know at what point the two versions separated, but it just goes to show the importance of execution in anything creative. Seen side by side, these two games are very similar, but one is great and the other really isn't. I hate this game, and perhaps what I hate most about it is the wasted potential, because I know it can be done well, but I think I've talked about it enough. We can finally move on, and thankfully the next game is much, much shorter. Just a heads up, this next section is going to contain flashing images, so if you're sensitive to that sort of thing you may want to skip to the next game, or listen to this one in the background. I'm going to put an icon up in the top right as long as this warning applies, and I'll let you know when it's over. What can you say about Jurassic Park for the arcade? Well, not much really. It's easily the shortest game I've played for this retrospective, clocking in at a whopping 16 minutes. You can play it to completion many times over in the time it takes you to watch this video, though ironically it is just as invested in wasting your time as the PC game, or at least wasting your money. Mechanically, all you really do is point and shoot. My definitely real arcade machine had this problem where the gun would try to point back to its starting position in the bottom left of the screen, which made precise aiming difficult occasionally, but it wasn't a huge problem and I was able to hash out a system where I could hover the crosshair pretty effectively in place if I needed to. There are no extra weapons, there aren't any power-ups, you just point and shoot. What do you expect? It's an arcade machine. What sets this game apart from the others I've covered so far in this retrospective is its speed and presentation. This game is fast. The music gets the blood pumping. You are constantly moving and things are constantly moving around you. There is barely a moment where things slow down. In 16 minutes you travel across the entire island through forests, plains, caves, an active volcano, and even drive the tour car through the visitor center. At one point you even drive right off a cliff. It is bonkers. This game is like a shot of adrenaline after the nadir of the PC version. The dinosaurs come at you so fast that it's actually impossible to avoid taking damage sometimes. Maybe it would be easier with a second player, but uh, I don't think I could convince anyone to play with me. In single player at least, all you can really do sometimes is sit back and let the dinosaurs swarm across you. The game really wants your money, and it's going to do everything it can to get it, even if that means cheating. It is very satisfying to hold them at bay though, especially with their constant squeaks and cries. <laughs>
And even if you can deal with the endless rush of dinosaurs, there are some attacks that you just can't block. If the Rex wants to bite you, it is going to bite you, no matter how much you shoot it. The pterodactyls come at you from so many angles, it's impossible to get them all. I barely ever got the Brachiosaurs to back off before they hit me, and good luck shooting all that Dilophosaurus spit or all those volcanic fireballs out of the air before they hit you. There are health packs strewn across the island, but they are few and far between, and they don't heal for much either. It's a good thing I had so much money lying around for extra credits. Mechanical simplicity and predatory monetary practices aside, it is an arcade machine after all. Where this game excels is presentation and atmosphere. It's the little moments, like how you can shoot the signs, or blow up the tour cars in the visitor's centre, or how this Brachiosaur sneezes on you at a level transition. It's also the big things, like the numerous times the T-Rex chases you, or this big bounding boulder, or the way you crash right through the doors of the visitor's centre. It's not trying to adapt the film or the book, it's just about providing a good time and a fun chase and it succeeds in that in spades. What little environmental influence it takes from the film is done with aplomb, little chance though you get to see most of it. It has a decent, if very familiar, roster of dinosaurs. There are raptors, dilophosaurs, brachiosaurs, triceratopses, gallimimuses, pterodactyls and ichthyosaurs, all of them old friends by now, and they look great. The only addition to the roster are these ankylosaurs, but they don't really do anything. The star of the show though is the T-Rex. Two T-Rexes even. This is the first game we've looked at to feature the book accurate number of Rexes, and it's a great twist to add to the final battle at the end of the game. They're not particularly challenging unless you happen to be short of spare change, but they're fun, like everything in the game. The ending you get lasts two seconds, but what were you expecting? It's an arcade machine. After going through the hell of the PC version legitimately, I feel as though I'd rank the rest of these games much lower if I had to do the same with them, and given how this game forces you to take damage sometimes, I'd say it's too unfair to really waste your money on, but the chances of that these days are slim. As you can play it today, I doubt it's the best arcade machine shooter ever made, but this game is short and sweet and worth a go if you've got 20 minutes to spare. You may not get the same experience as you would playing it in a real arcade with a real machine, but it's fun enough as it is at home that you're not really missing out on much. And just as well it's so short, because looking at it for too long gives me a headache, and that's really all I can say about it. Those of you sensitive to flashing lights can come back now. We're past the danger zone. I really tried to go into Jurassic Park 2 The Chaos Continues with an open mind. I really, really did. I don't go into games wanting to hate them. I give everything I play the benefit of the doubt, even when I know that game has been critically panned. But this game was on thin fucking ice from the very first moments of the opening cutscene. I'm going to be seeing this logo in my fucking nightmares. How many Jurassic Park tie-in games did you fuckers make? Whatever goodwill Ocean Software had fostered with the SNES game was well and truly gone by the time I got to The Chaos Continues, thanks to the genuinely atrocious experience of the PC version. I just couldn't give Ocean the benefit of the doubt anymore. The instant I sensed they were back on their bullshit, I turned on this game and never looked back. It did not take long. My playthrough for this game took a respectable four and a half hours, but I was ready to stop playing by the end of the first level about 30 minutes in, and that was entirely due to the gameplay. Perhaps what soured me on the game so quickly was how well it started. There's an introductory cutscene with dialogue even, crunchy though it is. Go! 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 Like the Sega CD game, The Chaos Continues is framed as a sequel to the film. Biosyn, much like Ocean Software, is back on their bullshit and have sent an army to Isla Nublar to secure the dinosaurs of Jurassic Park for their own nefarious ends. Of course, things don't go as planned. Pteranodons attack the choppers, and now here we are. It's a good hook, and it immediately sets up the more action-oriented tone of the game. You might think from this beginning that you're playing as a Biosyn soldier, the bad guys basically, but no. It never tells you this in-game, but this Schwarzenegger stand-in is actually Grant according to the manual. And yeah, no, I'm not seeing it. There is nothing of Alan Grant in this gun-toting himbo. It's not just the lack of a hat. Grant's a paleontologist. He didn't just pick up a gun and start training for his next battle with the dinosaurs as soon as he got to safety. It feels like the only reason this guy is referred to as Grant in the manual is because this is Jurassic Park, and in Jurassic Park, Alan Grant is the hero. Given this game is two-player, I almost expected the second playable character to be a roided-up Ian Malcolm, but no, he's a completely different character called Michael Wolfskin. And together, Alan Grant and Michael Wolfskin are going to trek across the island, killing literally everything they come across in order to stop Biosyn from stealing InGen's intellectual property. It is a weak follow-up to the promise of the opening cutscene. 
there is never this much plot present in the game again, aside from the mission briefings written to give context to where you're going and what you're doing. Wipe out the raptors with nerve gas. Get past a heavily defended biosyn blockade. Wipe out the raptors again, this time with a bomb. Fix the radio tower. Chase down a spy. Pick up supplies. Murder everyone in this building and don't question why. It's an attempt to flesh out the plot, to give it some variety, at least in abstract, because in practice what you're going to be doing for the vast majority of the game is run, jump, and shoot. Like all of Ocean's Jurassic Park tie-ins, this game is almost identical mechanically to a previous title I've already covered in this retrospective. There are some elements of their earlier efforts present in The Chaos Continues, they still haven't figured out how to make Grant aim in a straight line, but the game it draws most heavily from isn't even one of Ocean's own. This game plays almost exactly the same as the title release for the Sega Genesis by Blue Sky Soft. It's uncanny how close it is, it really feels like Ocean Software just glanced across the classroom and copied Blue Sky Soft's homework. True, there are only so many ways to do a 2D side-scroller, but they're so similar it really feels like Ocean saw the financial success of the Genesis version and tried to recreate it themselves. The controls for the Chaos Continues might be tighter and more responsive overall, but it still has the exact same range of movement right down to the cable swinging. There's suddenly an army of human enemies to contend with just like in the Genesis game. The level design is mostly built around navigating low-effort platforming puzzles in unnecessarily large mazes. The dinosaurs all act the same, and some of them even look the same as they did in the Genesis game too. The biggest difference between them is how much more of the chaos continues there is compared to the Genesis title. Like most of Ocean's efforts, it's a bloated mess. Otherwise, the only way to tell them apart is looks. I'll give Ocean Software this, their games looked great, and The Chaos Continues was no exception. The game's presentation is its strongest selling point, but it's also not enough to sustain a game across a 4 hour playtime. The first few times I saw this parallaxing jungle, or open field, I was impressed. The dinosaurs look great and the humans look great too. There's never any confusion about what you're looking at or who you're fighting, but by the end of the game I never wanted to see any of these sprites again. I never wanted to see any of these animations again. Everything looks good the first time you see it, but every single one of these levels is reused at least once, with only minor variations to the layouts or backgrounds. The only truly unique level is the final one, and most players will probably never even see it because it's such a chore to reach. The Chaos Continues actually fixes a few of the problems I had with the Genesis game, but it also introduces a host of new ones that make it worse by far. The first is the sheer size of the game. The Genesis title wanted two 13 mission campaigns, at least according to that article I referenced earlier, but ultimately only managed a 7 level Grant campaign and a 5 level Raptor campaign. At first glance it has the Chaos Continues beaten handily. There are only 6 missions listed on the select screen at the start of the game, but that's before you take into account that there are an additional 6 emergency missions that follow them. The main missions you can play in any order, but the emergency missions are given to the player in the arrangement the game has set, and you cannot fail a single one of them if you want to reach the additional two, possibly three, possibly four extra ending levels between the player and the credits. Which brings the final count to a potential 16, and that is insane when you consider there's no save system of any kind. Not even passwords to mark your progress. You have to do all this shit without game overing once, and it's just not fun. Because the other biggest issue The Chaos Continues introduces to the Genesis game's formula is an unfair level of difficulty. And I know, I know, I complained about how cruel the difficulty of the Genesis game was. And it was cruel, I stand by that. But The Chaos Continues is worse. Every single enemy is as bad as Mr. Go Fuck Yourself from the end of the Raptor campaign from the Genesis title. Whether you're fighting dinosaurs or fighting humans, but for a completely different reason. Mr. Go Fuck Yourself would stand in place and punish you if you got too close, but the enemies in this game almost never stop moving, and usually they're moving toward you. The raptors can leap in from off screen so quickly it can be hard to react, and even if you do manage to let off a shot in time, it usually won't be enough to drop them in one hit, even if you're using the most powerful weapons in the game. This isn't just because they're fast, but because there are multiple variants of the enemy raptors, and while the green ones will go down in one hit from the shotgun or tranquilizer missile launcher, yes, that's one of the weapons in the game, the red and grey ones can tank shot after shot after bloody shot. The speed at which they leap in means you have to be jumping practically the instant they appear on the side of the screen if you want to dodge them too. They're not the only enemies that have this problem either. Your human opponents are just as bad, if not even worse. The standard grunts might not jump, but they can rush in just as quickly as the raptors, and they usually come in waves. Far more frustrating are these grenade-toting motherfuckers who will start throwing usually before you even scroll far enough to see them, making it easy for you to just jump right into their explosives before you can even react. They've got fantastic aim too, all of the human enemies do. If you stand still inside of them, you are going to get hit. There is no way to avoid them but 
to keep moving. The Grenadiers' only saving grace is the arc of their fro, which at least gives you time to dodge. None of the other standard human enemies have this mitigating factor, but they can all still shoot at you before they're even fully on the screen. These flamethrower guys will just march right in and let a rip, or else they'll smugly wait for you on an out of reach platform just daring you to get in range. Once you do enter the range of their flamethrowers, they will not stop shooting until you kill them. Dodging past them just isn't an option, because they will deal constant contact damage to you as long as you're in range, and one flamethrower guy can easily take off half your health in one go if they don't kill you outright. The best way I found to deal with them was to duck under their flames and shoot, and even that didn't work 100% at the time. The only way to keep these gunmen or these scientists or these mechanics from getting off a shot and instantly killing you at low health is to shoot at them before they even appear and hit them right as they spawn. Jumping around or trying to duck under the projectiles doesn't really help either because enemy shots fire directly at your position rather than in a specific direction like all of your own attacks, at a speed that is usually too fast for the player to react. There's a limit to how many shots an enemy can fire on screen, but there's no limit to how many enemies there can be at any one time, which means if you find yourself fighting off an army, you're pretty much guaranteed to take damage. There's only one human enemy that wasn't a struggle to fight, and that was these rocket launcher guys. At least they were bound by the same rules as the player. Ironically, the ratio of reasonable enemies to digital cancers was inverted with the dinosaurs. The raptors were annoying from start to finish, especially if you found them on a slope or at the top of a ladder. More than once a raptor would leap out into the void to its death trying to kill me, and other times they would knock me down and bully me for my lunch money until I gave up and reset. There were even a couple of times where they glitched through the level geometry and fell right out of the universe but uh, sadly I don't have that footage anymore. Yes, the raptors were annoying, but the rest of the dinosaurs were pretty easy to avoid overall. The compies and over raptors run back and forth, annoying but not impossible to avoid. The flying bugs, yes they're dinosaurs, the gallimimuses and the dilophosaurs were all the easiest they've ever been in an ocean game, although the dilophosaurs could still shoot at you from off screen. Like the PC version, these giant pteranodons were just happy to be here. The triceratops inexplicably found underneath the island's volcano is intimidating but completely optional to fight until one of the final levels, but these small flies Flyers. Oh, the small flyers. They were a constant frustration in every section they appeared, swarming in from every possible angle with their stupid zigzagging movement to make dodging them impossible, never mind actually hitting them. But by far the worst enemy in the game was this guy. That's right. Mega Man. Fucking Mega Man can go die in a fire, because he's just not fair to fight. Forget about how much bloody health he has. He reads your inputs as you fight him. Try to duck, he'll duck with you. Try to jump, he'll just aim up. Try to run away, he'll just chase you down. And because projectiles are so fast in this game, if he gets off a shot, you're pretty much guaranteed to get hit. There's almost no chance you'll avoid it. If you have low health, running into this guy is basically a death sentence, even if he's the only enemy around. He's just so awful. Now take everything I've just said about the enemies and consider every time you're hit by anything other than a simple bullet, you're thrown flat on your ass for a full second, and that they sometimes respawn even if you've already killed them. Now add on top of that how much this game loves putting enemies in tight, cramped spaces, or behind objects you can't shoot through, or between objects you can't shoot through, or how it loves to hide them across gaps you need to jump, or at the top of ladders you need to climb, or right beside environmental hazards, or behind doors. The enemies in this game are so fucking fast they can have already started their attack before Grant even finishes walking through the door. You can literally be killed before you can even do anything to stop it. I mean, look at this shit. Too fucking fucking flamethrowers right beside the door. How is this fair? There's no reason to actually enter this room either. How is this anything other than a cruel instant death trap for an unsuspecting first time player? These enemies in the way the game just spams them at you is bullshit, and the game knows it's bullshit. Take this moment where you have to cross a gap in the jungle. There's a guy with a flamethrower standing on a platform in the middle of this pit, and the only way across is by slowly swinging from these vines. Unless you position yourself in exactly the right spot on the edge of the chasm so you can actually hurt the flamethrower, because even though you can see them, that doesn't always mean the game accepts that they can take damage, or you dare attempt shooting him while hanging from the vines, which is just going to waste time and get you hit, you are going to take damage when you cross over. Immediately after this section there's a health pack, which says to me the developers knew how unfair this section was, and added this pickup to lessen its sting, and even then, it's still surrounded by compies. 
This is a one-off moment of sympathy from the game. Most of the time health and ammo drops are hidden behind powerful enemies so the pickups don't actually improve your position. They just bring it back up to what it was before you went off the beaten path to search for help. The game is far less miserly with health and ammunition than Ocean's previous Jurassic Park tie-ins, but the difficulty is so stupidly high it doesn't matter. Even once you get the hang of the controls and learn the enemy patterns, it still doesn't help because there's usually so many of them one is bound to hit regardless of what you do. It's so frustrating! It really doesn't help that it feels like the game's enemies have far more options of attack than Grant. The controls are tight and responsive like all of Ocean's games except in one respect, the aiming. Aiming left or right is easy, but aiming up or at a diagonal is absolute cancer. Half the time when I tried to shoot at a diagonal it would aim in that direction but not actually fire, and sometimes it felt like it would only work if Grant was moving. It was so temperamental. And if you stop to shoot directly above you, when you hit up on the d-pad the gun will point upward, but it will also shift to the left or right depending on which direction you were last moving in. You can be standing directly beneath an enemy and shooting up at them, but the bullets will just sail right by because Grant's holding the gun out at arm's length. What is this shit? Why is it like this? Just aim up! The Genesis games got this right! What are you doing, Ocean? It should also be noted that enemy projectiles never lose their efficacy across large distances, but yours do. The game actively punishes you for trying to keep your distance from enemies that all hit like dump trucks by making your bullets weaker the further away they are from you when they hit anything. And they're not that strong to begin with. The stun gun and the rifle are effectively useless unless you literally hack the game with a game genie to make the latter a one hit kill weapon. The tranquilizer gun and the machine gun are little better. The enemies are so fast they'll just close the distance before these pea shoot shooters can put any of them down. The best and only worthwhile weapons in the game are the shotgun and the tranquilizer bazooka. They're the most satisfying to use but they have the least amount of ammo. Each only get 20 shots at the start of every level. And they still lose efficacy over distances! Oh, still hungry? Want another serving of bullshit? The non-lethal weapons don't hurt the humans, but they do hurt you if you're too close, and you're literally not allowed to use the lethal weapons on the dinosaurs. It makes an exception for the raptors and the T-Rex, thank fucking god, but blow away any of the other small annoying dinosaurs and this counter at the top of the screen will start to go down. Get it low enough and you'll just game over. Though it does go back up over time. Admittedly, this wasn't a problem on most levels since I invariably just ignored everything that wasn't a raptor, but it became a real serious fucking issue whenever these small flyers showed up. The tranquilizer gun is too crap to kill them quickly. My only option was the bazooka, and with so little ammo going around I had no choice but to resort to the shotgun. The first few times I didn't even know why I was game overing because the game never bothers to tell you that you need to keep the dinosaurs alive. The only way to learn this is to check the manual. Oh, and just to add insult to injury, there are levels that throw human and dinosaur enemies at you together, forcing you to use lethal weapons to get by, so good luck not racking up a few collateral kills. And just for dessert, the absolute bullshit falls that instant kill you when grants at low health have made the jump from the Genesis game too. Fuck off. To the game's credit, it does give you a dodge, which looks more like Grant striking a pose than anything else. Knowing it's a dodge, I sort of see it, but it's not actually that useful because pressing the button stops you dead in your tracks. And if you do that, you're just going to eventually get hit anyway, even if you do manage to successfully dodge the first few attacks. The game is constantly stacking the deck against you, and I feel like I haven't even scratched the surface. You're given the freedom to choose the six main levels in any order you want, but they're not listed in order of difficulty. The hardest two, Blockade and High Terror, are in the middle of the group, and the easiest, Protect the Gallimimus, is the very last one on the list. The only one in the correct position is T-Rex Rampage. I don't get it. What is this game? The Chaos Continues is terrible at telling you where to go, too. The first time you come to a level transition in the bushes of the opening mission, the arrow telling you that it's there is hidden behind a foreground object. And that's not even the most egregious example, either. Most of these levels, even the ones that are nothing but flat terrain running left to right, are convoluted mazes that have environments that are all so similar that it's impossible to tell where exactly you're meant to go, or even if you're going in the right direction. These levels are flush with dead ends, side areas that loop you back around to earlier parts of the map, and drops that literally lead nowhere. They're only here to turn you around and waste your time. You can suffer through some massive areas thinking you're going in the right direction, only to then discover the hell you've been marching through leads to a couple of pickups not worth the effort of reaching. There's nothing interesting about any of these levels either. Very, very occasionally you'll come across an interesting bit of background like the radio tower, or a puzzle like here at the end of one of the emergency missions. 
if you're really lucky you'll get a boss fight, but for the most part all these levels look the same, play the same, are the same, as at least one other mission in the game. The most interesting variation in the gameplay is a very specific section where you have to find a dropped tracking device by following the audio cues through this underground maze. Of course the audio cues never seem to help, and I only found the objective by using a guide, but at least it's something. Otherwise it's just an unending slog of the same enemies in the same environments over and over and over again. And then the game has the audacity to tell you to do it all over again with a time limit. Each of the emergency levels you play after completing one of the six main missions has a time limit, and no matter how much time they give you, they're usually so strict that there's no way you're finishing them with more than a few seconds to spare. It is frustrating enough to play this game at your own pace. It is infuriating to play it at the games because it has no reservations about pulling all the same bullshit that it does in the main levels. That example I used earlier of the flamethrower guy in the middle of the pit you have to cross, that was in one of these timed levels. Some of these timed levels are just as maze-like as the main ones, and they're just as shit at letting you know you're going in the right direction. That you get knocked down every time you get hit by an enemy isn't that much of a problem in the normal levels, but it becomes a huge issue here because every second counts get knocked down one time too many, get stuck on obstacles or blocked by dangerous enemies one time too many, and you've just got no hope of completing these missions. And you have to complete them too. You cannot access the ending levels of the game if you don't, so you have to rush, but you can't rush because the game puts every obstacle it possibly can in your way, but you don't have the time available to deal with all of them safely, so you have to rush. It's just a vicious cycle. Even with the advantage of save states, I had to restart some of these levels over and over again because the time limits were so strict. Without a guide, I never would have got through them at all. It's horrible, honestly worse than anything the Genesis game did, and right up there with the PC version in terms of time-wasting game design. But somehow, somehow, the Chaos Continues commits an even greater sin than the PC version. Because although you need to beat all six emergency levels to reach the climactic section of the game, if you want the complete ending, yes, not best ending, not good ending, the complete ending, you have to play through the game on the hardest difficulty. And that is just a chore. If you wuss out and play the game on normal, it doesn't even give you the final confrontation with the T-Rex either. That requires playing the Chaos Continues on hard as well. On the lowest difficulty it just ends with your assault on Biosyn's headquarters. It is such a slap in the face to make this game so hard, to make the player jump through so many hoops, and then just lock the ending behind a difficulty setting. Don't get me wrong, I don't mind locking extras behind difficulty settings, or even extra endings behind difficulty settings. That's fine, but this isn't side content, there's only one route through the game. This is the final fucking boss. Both of them. What are you doing, Ocean? It's not like they're even worth it either because they're still just the same shit levels you've been playing the entire game. It doesn't feel like a reward for playing the game on hard. It still just feels like a chore. Because first you have to assault the Biosyn base, which is yet another indoor vertical maze. Then you have to disarm a bunch of bombs Biosyn leaves under the island's volcano out of spite once you've defeated them. Then you have to fight the T-Rex once you discover the last of the bombs can't be disarmed. And then you have to defeat this giant helicopter as both InGen and Biosyn flee the island. It's an exciting climax on paper, but it's a fucking slog in gameplay. A full hour of my four hour successful run was dedicated just to these climactic missions. The game just refuses to end. Perhaps what sucks most about how the game locks the final few levels behind its hardest difficulty is that the boss fights in the game are genuinely the best part of it. There are six in total, and unsurprisingly two of them are repeats of earlier encounters. Two are the same beefed up human enemies, two are the T-Rex, and two are Biosyn helicopters that are surprisingly very different fights. The human bosses are the least impressive. They're big and they can take a lot of damage, but for the most part they're paper tigers. Unless you're on low health and can't tank their occasional double taps. Shoot enough lead into them and they'll go down pretty easy. Most of the time they weren't even looking at me, and they weren't my focus for the fights either. My focus was always on the Mega Men that always accompanied the boss fights, because they were actually dangerous. Slightly more engaging were the fights with the T-Rex. The first fight takes place on the back of a moving car. You have to shoot the T-Rex at the right time to keep it from catching up to the vehicle, since the driver can't seem to find the accelerator. The vehicle gives the fight a sense of speed and urgency that the rest of the game can't match, and the Rex is an impressive opponent. The one thing I hate about this iteration of the fight is a bit of Ocean's patented bullshit. All along this level there are Biosyn grunts hanging from the vines that you cannot avoid getting shot by, nor can you shoot them back. You have to 
stand still on the vehicle or you'll fall off and you have to keep your guns on the T-Rex because it can do so much more damage. If you try and focus on the biosyn grunts for even a second, you're getting chomped. And just as a last middle finger to the player, at the end of this section the car drives right off a cliff, so if you don't jump onto the vine in time, you're fucked. There's no vehicle in the rematch, but there's no biosyn grunts either. You're on your own with nothing but your wits and a very angry T-Rex. The aim of this fight isn't to hold the Rex back long enough to reach the end of the level. Your only option is to stand and fight, and good luck. You get access to the most powerful weapon in the game at the end of an earlier level, the Super Bazooka, and you're going to need it for this fight, but it's very unlikely you'll have enough ammo for it. You start the fight with 20 shots, unless you bothered to collect ammo for it while disarming Biosyn's bombs under the volcano. Though even if you find every ammo pickup there is, you're still going to need a whole lot of shotgun and bazooka ammo to take the Rex down. It wouldn't be too bad if you had more space, but the level ends abruptly at a bottomless pit not far from the starting position, and if the Rex catches up to you, you're cooked. It is a very frustrating fight, but fortunately the two Biosyn helicopters are much better. Wait, why is the Rex exploding? You fight the first at the end of the Gallimimus level. It comes in swinging with a bunch of attacks, lines of bombs, bullet sweeps, but the most dangerous weapon at its disposal is this cage. At least at first. What I like about this fight is that once you damage the helicopter enough, it drops the cage, creating a platform for you to stand on or hide beneath to avoid its other attacks. The rest of the fight is pretty simple, but it's fun. And the final battle against this massive Biosyn attack helicopter is the best in the game, difficult though it is. You have control of your own helicopter, but the hitbox only covers Grant, giving you a lot of room to move. The Biosyn chopper has a lot of attacks, missiles, drop bombs, a chain gun, a bunch of soldiers taking pot shots from the windows, but they can all be avoided. The chain gun can't hit you if you're on the right edge of the screen. The missiles are slow and can be shot out of the air if you're quick enough. The dropping bombs will never be a problem if you stay high on the screen. The only real danger is the soldiers, but once they're dead, they're dead. The more you damage the various parts of the helicopter and the more parts of it you destroy, the fewer attacks you leave it to fight back until it just gives up and falls out of the sky. This is a great fight, it's fucking hard, and it's definitely not worth playing through the entire game to experience, but gameplay wise, yeah, this is good. There, I finally said something nice about the game, I don't have to feel bad about ripping it to shreds anymore. Actually there's something else I can say too, I'll give the game this. It does try to bring back the plot started in the opening cutscene in these climactic levels by presenting the Biosyn executive from the introduction as an enemy that you can kill. He's not presented as a boss, the executive can call down an army of goons on Grant as he makes his escape, but he goes down easy enough to a shotgun blast or two. Even better, according to the manual, this guy is Lewis Dodson. It's not quite the same as feeding the guy to a dinosaur, but blowing a T-Rex sized hole in his chest is still pretty damn satisfying. It's a nice little reward for making it through the rest of the game. You want Jurassic Park? You've got it pal. <laughs> Not that it particularly felt like Jurassic Park. Yeah, the logo's all over the place, and there are a couple of vehicles from the film, but that's really the only connective tissue aside from a few names dropped in the manual and the opening cutscene. You still do a lot of the same things you did in Ocean's earlier Jurassic Park games, but they're devoid of context here, much like the Genesis game, perhaps even more so here. You could just rename this title Dino Attack, and you wouldn't have to change much. This guy isn't Grant, this guy isn't Lewis Dodson, none of this sounds like John Hammond. I've been re-watching the TV adaptation of Westworld recently, another trademark Crichton cautionary tale about a theme park gone wrong. And something I, my friends who've seen it, and probably a lot of other people as well, have always thought about the show is that as soon as it inevitably left the park, it would lose what made it special. It was only while working on this video that I realised the same is also true of Jurassic Park. The two more well-regarded films are both set in the park, the other four are nowhere near as liked. The theme park is a fundamental part of what makes Jurassic Park Jurassic Park. Without it, it's just another dime a dozen dinosaur story, the same way Westworld without the park is just another dime a dozen story about robots. You can have dinosaurs, but they only get you so far. I said much, much earlier in this video that Jurassic Park is nothing without its dinosaurs, but I was talking about variety in presentation, and this game does have a good variety that it presents well, but it's still not Jurassic Park. You can have an island, you can have Biosyn and InGen and all the returning characters you like, it's just not the same without the theme park. The film sequels have been demonstrating that since The Lost World and Dominion ended the discussion forever with how much of a train wreck that movie turned out to be.
Side note, but it's honestly hilarious how well these early tie-in games made in the 1990s predicted the premises of films that wouldn't be made until the 2010s and 2020s. But anyway, this is something that all the other games I've looked at for this retrospective understood very well, with the only exceptions being the Genesis games by Blue Skysoft. And honestly to me, that's explanation enough as to why The Chaos Continues feels so unlike Jurassic Park, because it's just the Genesis game on steroids. Even the PC version, shit though it was, got the atmosphere right. That felt like Jurassic Park, even if just a little. The Sega CD game felt like Jurassic Park despite framing itself as a sequel. The Chaos Continues doesn't really feel like anything. Remember those dinosaur toys I mentioned way back when I was talking about the Game Gear adaptation? Playing this game feels like playing with those toys, only nowhere near as fun. This game is cancer. I never want to play it again. And yet, I have to, because I accidentally deleted the footage of my first run, and I don't want you to be staring at a blank screen for 30 minutes or however long this section is. I'm writing this section of the video before playing it again in an effort to remain fair to the game before I inevitably come to hate it even more than the PC version, but I honestly don't know why I'm going to the effort because there's so little to like about this game anyway. The visuals are good, the music and sound design are good too, there's real weight behind the weapons, the dinosaurs all have their film roars, and the soundtrack gets the blood pumping, but the gameplay is just so terrible. I'm just so not looking forward to doing it again. Thank fuck my very real Super Nintendo comes with a very real game genie that can turn the rifle into a one-hit kill on everything, and no, before you ask, I have no regrets about cheating on this second playthrough. Maybe the manual will have some advice on how to get through it. Oh look, a hints and tips section. Let's see what it has to say. Learn the attack patterns of the dinosaurs. Okay, not helpful. Don't waste your ammunition. Thanks. Learn the quickest route to your mission goal. Yeah, that might actually help if I knew where it fucking was to begin with. Stay cool. Stay cool? Oh yeah, great fucking advice. I'm gonna have that engraved on my fucking tombstone. Stay cool? Fuck off, game. Jurassic Park 2 The Chaos Continues is a terrible game. It is a tedious, frustrating, mind-numbing experience that is not worth playing for the few good features it does have. I didn't think Ocean could outdo themselves after the truly atrocious PC version, and speaking honestly I still don't, but good god did they give it a red hot go. Its obvious effort went into some places, but for the most part it feels like a soulless cash grab more than it does Jurassic Park. I had never heard of Ocean Software before sitting down to make this video, and now I'll never be free of them. The company went defunct in the late 1990s, its games are now no more than digital fossils from another age, but they are a developer that is going to haunt me for years to come. I don't know how they captured lightning in a bottle with their SNES adaptation of Jurassic Park, because the rest of the tie-in games they made for the film are absolute dog shit, and this one is just the cherry on top of the pile. It is Jurassic Park in name only. At least they got the Chaos Continues part right. Throughout the making of this retrospective, I was constantly thinking how each game couldn't get any worse than the last as I was playing through them. I didn't think anything could outdo the PC version, and overall I think that is still the worst game I had to play for this video. But The Chaos Continues claimed a respectable bronze, and Jurassic Park Interactive for the 3DO came very, very close to snatching the crown right off the PC version's head. Jurassic Park Interactive is eight minigames wrapped up in a bundle of very charming 90s presentation. It lulled me into a false sense of security early on with its campy charisma, then held me hostage for four and a half hours until I finally reached the credits. I knew going into this game that it wasn't regarded very well, and that it was basically just a collection of minigames, but the opening moments actually got me. I don't know why either, the introduction is just a very long-winded retelling of the plot by a narrator who really has nothing to work with. It is set to the the actual film score by John Williams and played over very crunchy clips from the movie, so maybe that lulled me into thinking this would be more than what it turned out to be, because what it turned out to be was hell. They framed hell pretty well though. I guess I'm just a sucker for this kind of campy 90s garbage because I loved the presentation in this game. You're not just playing minigames for the sake of playing minigames. You're playing minigames to rescue the survivors from around the park and undo Dennis Nedry's hacking of the computer systems to perform a reboot and recall the ship to the island before Raptors escape to the mainland. The user interface is a bit obtuse, but it works and I like how it gives you a full map of the island. It creates a sense of size that just playing the minigames alone 
alone would not. Some of the survivors have a long way to go to get out of danger, and you get to see them take just about every step of the journey. There's a screen to show you where all the dinosaurs are, but really it's just a screen to show you which minigames are on all the tiles. You might notice there's two unique tiles for a Brachiosaur and a Triceratops, but they're not actually attached to any minigame. You can't even reach the Brachiosaur tile, and once on the Triceratops tile, you can't leave it. They're nothing but a tease of potential extra content. What matters is this screen, which shows the locations of the survivors. And man, they're looking a little different. I was pissing myself laughing at the people they got to double the film characters, like John Hammond and Ray Arnold, and Ian Malcolm especially. He must be protected at all costs. It's very strange to think the developers got the rights to use the film footage and the soundtrack, but not the likenesses of the actors. But honestly, this only added to the charm for me. I wanted to save not Jeff Goldblum and not B.D. Wong and not Wayne Knight more than I think I would have the original actors. I especially loved these little vignettes, showing the actors running away from unseen dinosaurs. They're so compressed you could have used portraits of the actual actors for their pictures, since there's no way you'd be able to tell the difference in these tiny pixelated videos. Notice how the tour car is always just enough out of sight that you can't see it's not actually a tour car, and is just a personal vehicle owned by one of the devs. None of this stuff was necessary, but I really like that they went the extra mile to include it. It deserved a better game, honestly. That's not to say the minigames don't look as good. The ones you play as you move survivors around the island all look pretty great, simple though they are. They definitely outstayed their welcome. But to begin with, they were at least nice to look at. The minigames you play in order to reboot the computer system do not look as good, and it's them I'm going to focus on first. There are five in all, and if you're lucky, you'll only have to play each once. I was not lucky. The first two, Spit Doom and Dactyl Scream, are so simple they're not even really worth talking about. They're just Jurassic Park themed interpretations of space invaders. There's no strategy to them, no mechanics to engage with beyond how fast you can spam the shoot button, and even then sometimes it doesn't matter since you can die literally as you spawn in thanks to an unlucky draw from the random number generator working the gears of the game behind the scenes. There's no win state either, it'll just keep going forever. You only need to play until you get a score of 20,000, at which point you can just let yourself die. This is actually the goal of each of these minigames, get to 20k and you can stop. The third of these minigames, Dino Eggum, was where things really started to fall apart, and after that they never really stopped. The third minigame is just 3D Breakout, and it was torture. Your goal is to hit the squares without dropping the eggs, which is easier said than done. Each square cycles through several pictures as you hit them, but eventually they run out, leaving most of the background blank, and good luck getting these stupid fucking eggs to go where you want them. Good luck hitting them at all! There is a shadow and a line the eggs can't cross on the bottom of the screen which does help somewhat, but it's still difficult to angle the cursor into the right position in time. There were some times when the egg wasn't even touching the cursor and the game counted the hit, but others where I was right on top of it and it still broke. I never got the sense I was actually able to influence its direction either. I tried catching it with different areas of the cursor, or coming in from the side like a tennis racket, but it didn't seem to do anything. What was most frustrating is how sometimes the egg would clearly hit one of the remaining squares, but it wouldn't actually count it. It was mind-numbing. Thankfully I'd saved up enough extra lives on my successful run that I could just drop the egg and restart with a guaranteed shot at one of the remaining squares, otherwise I don't think I could have done it. Like with the other hacking minigames, your goal is to get your score to 20,000, and mercifully there are more squares on the board than are needed to reach that number. As soon as I hit 20,000, I dropped the rest of the eggs and ran. This mini game can go in the bin. I never want to play 3D Breakout again. The fourth and fifth minigames were mechanically almost identical. Instead of Space Invaders, these games are Jurassic Park themed iterations of Asteroid, and they were even less fun than Dino Eggum. That was partially my fault though. My very real 3DO has a very powerful set of parts and it was running the game way, way faster than was ever intended at release. Trying to play the fourth minigame, Triceratomp, where you play a tour car shooting at Triceratopses, was made damn near impossible by how fast you moved, even tapping the forward button. I had to stay in place and spin like a turret just mashing the shoot button as quickly as I could to keep the Triceratopses at bay, which was easier said than done when they could suddenly swarm in from off screen and put a run to bed. Even more frustrating were the times when I just died on nothing, or when the Triceratopses would rub a band into me as soon as they got near. Sometimes I would just spawn right back on top of the dinosaur that killed me too. I don't think slowing the game down would really fix these problems. It certainly didn't fix my issues with the fifth game, Rap Attack, but it did at least make the last game playable. 
At the speed I was originally playing the game, this section is impossible. You move way too fast to do anything but rocket right into a spinning floppy disk or instant death fan. And you can't not move either because a few seconds after spawning in, that instant death fan will start sucking you in toward itself. You can't strafe or move backward either, you can only go forward, meaning playing at this speed is basically undoable. Yet even after I slowed the game down, I still spent more time with this minigame than any other because of how obtuse it is. Like with the other hacking minigames, your goal is to reach 20,000 points, and the game tells you that when you start, but what it doesn't tell you is that it wants you to get 20,000 points on the second level. The manual doesn't tell you this either. It gives detailed explanations on each of the Free Island minigames, right down to providing maps for one of them, but says next to nothing about the five hacking minigames. The most warning you get about the second level of the final game is a line saying, quote, sometimes scoring points won't be enough, end quote. I couldn't find any explanation on the internet either. There might be videos about this game on YouTube, but I couldn't find a single text guide or walkthrough anywhere, which is probably a first. I spent so long trying to get a score the game would accept on the first level, I was genuinely considering just giving up on the game and making this section of the video video about how Jurassic Park Interactive bested me. I only stumbled onto the answer completely by accident by flying into the formerly instant death fan that eventually stops spinning and becomes a level exit once you get a high enough score. I assume, anyway. I never actually figured out what exactly you have to do to stop it spinning. The lack of communication to the player that you've made enough progress to proceed is bad enough, but making the level exit the same thing that kills you the rest of the time you're playing is just garbage. There's another fan in the second level too, and it never stops spinning. I racked up over 100,000 points waiting for this fucking thing to shut off, and it never did. I probably would have kept going forever, expecting another level, if I hadn't been called away from my very real 3DO for something else. I don't even know how I won, I just came back to the game to find that I was victorious. This is my first time actually seeing this in the edit, and I still don't really understand what you're meant to do to complete this section. But whatever, it's done. We never have to look at it again. These five minigames are all played in service of recalling the boat to the island to stop a bunch of raptors escaping to the mainland. I thought at first when I played that they were meant just to reboot the system and you'd have to send one of the survivors to the visitor's centre or somewhere else to contact the boat. It is the only other tile on the island to have a red objective marker after all. But no, once you complete Rap Attack, that's it. Boat recalled. Mission accomplished. I don't know why I'm complaining. The less of this game I have to play the better, honestly, but it is odd that these two objectives are so separate from each other. I also thought completing these five hacking minigames would somehow influence the survivor minigames, like it would make them easier somehow as you restore power to the park and reboot the computer systems. For example, maybe you don't need as many keys to complete the raptor game. Maybe you don't need to defeat as many spitters in the Dilophosaur game. Maybe you don't need to play the T-Rex game at all. I also thought maybe Maybe sending the survivors through the maintenance sheds or the visitor center would impact the hacking minigames somehow. Make it so you don't need such a high score to pass each one as you flip the circuit breakers and power switches or something. But no, the two sides of the game are completely separate. Even this timer is only related to the hacking minigames. I thought it was counting down how much time you have to complete the entire game, like with the Sega CD title, but it's actually only counting down how much time is left before the boat reaches the mainland. I think the only thing it affects is how many people are left on the boat by the time you make the call. Once you hit this button, you have all the time in the world to get everyone to safety. Which makes the hacking minigames an obvious first priority for every single run, and that is a real problem, because the rest of the game is extremely repetitive. I'll give the game this. Getting all of the survivors across the island to safety did create an atmosphere of journey and escape. It's nothing like the heights of the SNES game though. It was entirely contained to the map of the island. Watching the pieces representing each survivor move around and bunch up at the helipad in order to escape was what created that sense of journey, as did the little vignettes before some of the minigames. Like I said before about the presentation, this aspect of the title deserves a better game. It has so much potential but it just falls apart as soon as you add actually start to play it. There is nowhere these characters need to go but the helipad. They don't need to go to the visitor center to perform a system reboot. They don't need to visit the maintenance sheds to cycle the power. They don't need to visit Hammond's house to get a keycard, or the garage to get a car, or the dock to call the boat. The only tile on the board that matters is the helipad, which means as soon as you figure out a route across the island that works for practically everyone, the game is effectively over. All that's in question now is how much time it will actually take to get everyone to the helipad. It's not like you have to 
do it in one go like one of the earlier games. Jurassic Park Interactive features a save system. The only real variable is the difficulty. The lower the setting, the fewer survivors you have to escort to the helipad. On Advanced, the level I played, there's 11, but on Intermediate there's only 7, and on Normal only 5. I don't actually think it affects the challenge of the minigames, it's just the number of survivors you need to save. Which, I suppose, means I have to talk about the process of saving them. Unsurprisingly, you do it with minigames. There are three in total, and even with an optimal route, you're going to be playing them a lot. The first we'll look at is the most mechanically engaging, but it's also the most boring in my opinion. The Dilophosaur minigame is a shooting gallery where you have to shock the spitters before they blind you with their venom. The visibility of the screen is a good indicator of how much health you have left, and it can get pretty dark before you game over too. <laughs> Was that way night again? If you zap the Dilophosaurs quick enough they won't spit, which makes speed a must. You've got a limited battery on the cattle prod, but I never encountered a situation where I ran out before I died. What's interesting about this minigame is that not all of the dinosaurs are hostile. Some of the Dilophosaurs are just hanging out, which means you have to be careful not to accidentally zap them as they bound across the screen. Hit them with even a glancing shot and you'll have even more Dilophosaurs to deal with. There's actual strategy here. Sometimes it's better to let one of the hostile dinosaurs hit you, rather than risk making another enemy from a passerby, but that's really all the good I can say about it. It's not too bad a game the first few times you play it, especially when early on it pits you against an easy three enemy Dilophosaurs instead of the maddening slog of seven the late game constantly throws at you, but after a handful of playthroughs it really starts to show its problems. It is really hard to aim this stupid cattle prod. You can't just point it at a Dilophosaur and shoot. These yellow boxes need to be present in order for the hit to count, even if they appear too quickly sometimes for you to even notice they were there. The more boxes on screen, the harder the zap you'll give to the spitters. With a good shock, you can take them down to half health in one go, but it is very hard to line up that good a shot. Moving, the Dilophosaurs run low and horizontal, but shooting, they stand high and vertical. If you're tracking one moving and then it stands up suddenly, you can waste a shot, no problem. Not only that, if you line up a shot on a stationary Dilophosaur, one that's moving can run in front of your target and take the hit instead, potentially creating a new enemy that you will have to kill before the minigame ends. Far more frustrating is how the Dilophosaurs love to hide behind these trees in the foreground, which you cannot shoot through, but they can. Each of these Dilophosaur shooting galleries can take upwards of two minutes, and you're going to be playing them three or four times for each survivor you mean to rescue. There are only one or two variations on the pattern too, just like the boss fights with the T-Rex way way back in the NES game. It'd be okay as a flash game you played once on Newgrounds in the mid-2000s, but as a minigame you have to play over two dozen times in order to complete this title, it's just tedious. I played it a total of 17 times just on my successful run, and I didn't even save all of the survivors, nor is that counting my abandoned test run which probably bumps the number up to over 20. I never wanted to see this screen again after finishing this game, and looking at it while I'm editing just makes me feel tired. The second most common game I played was the Raptor one, and at first glance it's actually quite impressive. It's a very primitive first person survival horror game, but it works. The atmosphere created by the blank walls and the low draw distance build a sense of nightmarish foreboding that is only accentuated by the constant heartbeat thumping in your ears. That gets faster the closer you get to your pursuer. There's no music, there's just you, the corridors, and the raptor hunting you through them. I thought it was going to be another maze like the first person sections of the PC version, and on the first time through it did feel that way, but on repeat plays I learned the layout pretty quickly and realised, oh, this map is tiny. This is it in its entirety, presented, for some reason, in the game's manual. At least it doesn't give the key locations away. The real star of this section, though, is the raptor. This thing is fucking terrifying, and I don't know why. It's not just the atmosphere. Even the most tense of survival horror games can lose their impact over time. It's something else. Maybe it's how it doesn't make any sound at all until it catches you. <coughs> Maybe it's the way it walks, which seems weirdly human. Maybe it's the way it looms out of the darkness when you least expect it. I don't know, but this thing never stopped being disturbing to me, even after I learned the layout of the map and could basically avoid it 100% of the time. I was always a little bit worried I would turn around and find it right behind me. The first time I saw it, I stopped and just started backing away because it was so off-putting. One time it actually scared the shit out of me by opening this door when I thought I was safe on the other side. It comes across as quite crafty in the ways it tries to flank you, even though I know it can't possibly be trying to do so. No way is this girl that clever. The game cannot be programmed that well. 
Atmosphere and terrifying raptor aside, this game is just a key hunt, and every key is always in the same position. Sometimes you only need one, other times you'll need to travel through all five sections. It never got quite as tedious as the Dilophosaur game because of how disturbing the raptor was, and how I only had to play it once for each survivor, but it definitely became a chore as the game went on, and it stopped letting me off with only having to find one or two keys. That said, it's a pretty good interpretation of the raptor hunt from both book and film, at least in concept. It feels like the kind of thing that would come out of a very short game jam. If this had been expanded out into its own game, with properly designed levels and mechanics, it might have even been good. The same cannot be said of the last minigame. The last minigame concerns the T-Rex. It's a car chase, where you have to navigate a long road avoiding obstacles to escape the rampaging tyrant. It's a great adaptation of a film set piece in principle, but in practice it is borderline unplayable. I spent more time than I would care to admit trying to beat this on my first attempt to play the game, but I could never get Gennaro over the finish line. The T-Rex caught me every time, though not for lack of trying. That was when I was still playing the game at full speed, but when I slowed it down on my next successful playthrough, it was still impossible. The section still ran too fast at this speed, even though the Dilophosaur game was little more than a slideshow. I have to assume it's possible on an actually real 3DO, but I'd still bet it's pretty challenging. The driving itself isn't really the hard part, it's the obstacles littering the sides of the road. Unlike the other two main minigames, there's no definite pattern to them. You can't just memorise the route and flow through it like a speedrunner, you have to be constantly paying attention. And when the game is moving at this speed, there is no way to account for them. By the time you see the obstacles, there's a good chance you've already hit them. It doesn't help that their hitboxes are massive, so you can't just coast down the centre of the road, and the game loves hiding them around tight corners. Each time you hit them, the game stops you for a moment, but just to add insult to injury, hitting the accelerate button also causes the T-Rex to chase you a bit faster. It is drawn to movement, after all. There were moments where I was able to find a sort of rhythm and actually avoid the obstacles, but I have no fucking clue how I did it. There were moments where I think I got right down to the finish line, but I was never able to cross it, and that was only the easier one mile version of the minigame. This is the only part of any game I played for this retrospective that I could not finish. And because of that, any survivor that required passing through a T-Rex tile to reach the golden route to the helipad was written off as a necessary sacrifice. Ironically, all four who did get eaten in my playthrough survived the book, and three of them survived the movie too. But I guess this is just the dark timeline where Grant, Ellie, Harding, and Gennaro ended up dead. Sorry guys. I tried my best. It takes a very long time and a handful of, ahem, <laughs> tragic accidents. But once you get everyone to the helipad, the game is over. I managed to get 7 out of 11 to safety, but the only one I cared about was Dr. Wu, and he was the first one I rescued, so there you go. In my first playthrough, I just gave up after a while and let the dinosaurs get everyone. And yes, even the kids can end up as dino fodder, which is surprisingly hardcore for a selection of minigames. You don't even get an ending cutscene, you just get a pat on the back or a slap on the wrist of an ending screen, and then these truly horrifying credits where the developers anamorph into dinosaurs, including the most famous dinosaur of all, a camera. And you know what? That might actually explain why the raptor had such a human-like walk. I was screaming in disbelief the whole way through these images, and now you get to look at them too. You're welcome. Jurassic Park Interactive has a lot of potential, but aside from a bit of campy charm and a very loose grasp on the magic of the source material, just about everything I look back on fondly for this title is stuff I've projected onto it. All the mechanical possibilities that the game never fleshed out, all the potential vignettes featuring the discount versions of the characters, all the promise this kind of game has at first glance, strip away that daydream of what could be, and you have little more than a repetitive grab bag of tedious garbage that really isn't worth playing to completion. I like that the game gave some love to some of the film's secondary characters like Jerry Harding, Ray Arnold, and Dr. Wu, and the first time through the minigames are actually playable. But this is not a good title, and I'm never going to play it again. It doesn't even have that many dinosaurs. And say what you will about the next game, but at least it gets that part of Jurassic Park right. I would love to be able to say that this game is a tale of redemption for Blue Sky Soft. I'd love to be able to say it fixes all the problems present in the original Genesis game, and improves on the formula enough to make it good. 
I'd love to be able to say that about Jurassic Park Rampage Edition, but I just can't. At first glance, a lot of the things about it are better than the original Genesis game. It leaves a good first impression with its particularly radical main menu. It looks better, it plays better, the level design is vastly improved, for the most part. The difficulty is much better balanced, for the most part. The Raptor campaign no longer feels like an afterthought slapped on at the last second. There's not even any bullshit fall damage! It should be easy to compare the games and say this one is definitely superior, but I just can't. This game still feels incomplete. This game still feels rushed out the door to meet a deadline. It lacks a lot of the problems of the original Genesis title, but it also has a lot of new issues too. It's frustrating. I want to say I like this game, but I just can't, and it's difficult to articulate why. The best comparison I can make, weirdly, is to Twin Peaks. In 1992, after the conclusion of the show's bloated second season, the show's co-creator David Lynch made a prequel movie, Fire Walk With Me, to try and tie up a few hanging threads left over from the series. Over 20 years later in 2014, a compilation of deleted scenes from Fire Walk With Me was released as Twin Peaks The Missing Pieces, and that is what Jurassic Park Rampage Edition feels like. It is the missing pieces to Jurassic Park's Fire Walk With Me. Rampage Edition feels like nothing but cup content they couldn't fit into the original game, but there's also almost nothing of that original game in Rampage Edition either. They are two separated halves that, if combined, might actually form a complete game, dare I say even a decent game. But divided as they are, it's just not there. Though I'll still take it over most of Ocean's contributions to the Jurassic Park tie-in catalogue. That Rampage Edition feels like the missing half of Jurassic Park for the Genesis is apt because it took me about the same amount of time to complete, just over two hours in total, with each hour roughly spent playing through each of the two campaigns. Once again you have the option of playing as Grant or one of the Raptors, though presumably not the same Raptor as in the original game since it, you know, escaped. Rampage Edition might be a remaking concept, but it actually positions itself as a sequel to the original game in terms of plot, what little there is anyway. The story, which is given on a single page of the manual, is this. While escaping Isla Nublar at the end of the first game, Grant spots a helicopter of InGen scientists flying in to recover the eggs and DNA before the Costa Rican government bombs the island into the ground. Worried this might lead to the creation of another park, Grant crashes the helicopter back on the island, determined to stop the scientists at all costs. None of this is ever brought up in the game, nor does collecting eggs, DNA samples or embryo containers change anything but your final score. The goal as far as gameplay is concerned is to escape, same as the original. The raptor doesn't even get a mention in the manual's plot synopsis. I guess she's just along for the ride. We'll get to her in a bit. Grant's campaign spans five levels, six if you include the very short final battle against the T-Rex. Unlike the original game where you progressed across the island level by level, here you're free to pick between three of the five missions to begin with, then play the final two in set order. What's immediately obvious about these five new missions is how unique they are from each other, and just about everything from the original game too. The aviary and ancient ruins are very much focused on level verticality, but in very different ways and with very different visuals. The planes are mostly a straight sprint from left to right, with a few rocky hills and fences to avoid. The ship is a mixture of interior and exterior areas you have to blast your way through that ends in a race away from rising water levels. The river rapids, admittedly, is pretty much a repeat of the river level from the first game, but hey, this time it turns orange. All these levels are huge, be they vertical or horizontal, but they're much more densely packed with content than the levels of the original game. I'm not talking about enemies either, though there are certainly a lot of them. I'm talking about the way you interact with the levels. There are bridges that can hold your weight and bridges that can't, platforms that rise up and down, ladders to climb, cables to ride, walls to bust through and doors to kick down. It's not just a slog of bad platforming puzzles surrounded with enemies that can hit you from off screen. There was actual effort put into these levels. Each one comes with a gimmick that isn't repeated anywhere else. The aviary has pteranodons that will fly down and grab Grant to carry him back up to the nest like the little baby he is. The river rapids puts you back in the raft to navigate the rocks. The ship has slippery frozen sections and machinery in various states of repair that can all go straight to hell. The plains straight up gives you a Gallimimus to ride, and the ancient ruins give you a couple of Triceratopses to mount too. Not to mention this evil idol thing that tries to kill you. I really don't know what that was about. Genetically resurrected dinosaurs I can accept, but a haunted pre-Columbian ziggurat is just too silly for Jurassic Park. 
Each of the levels is longer too, but in a good way. There are many paths through them, most of them anyway, but to compensate there are a lot of checkpoints to find as well. The game may no longer feature a password system, but it's also nowhere near as hard. It's much easier to find health, and even extra lives hidden around the level environments. <laughs> It is a huge improvement, or at least it seems that way at first. Like the original game, both campaigns feature the same levels, though not in the same order, and not with the same exit areas. The cracks begin to show in the level design when you realise both mission routes are present in both campaigns, but the game is very bad at giving directions on which one you're meant to follow. The checkpoints can point you in the right direction, but even if you follow them, they can lead you to dead ends, as one did here to me in the ancient ruins. The arrow was pointing right, and there was a triceratops to ride, but nothing beyond it. I spent about 15 minutes minutes trying to figure out what to do here until I finally looked up a guide and realised I had to backtrack up the level to a different area and then head left, not right at all. Sometimes the checkpoint arrows point you in directions you can't go either, which happened in the river rapids. It was so easy to get turned around in the aviary I more or less just fell down the level until I found the exit. Aside from the very hit or miss checkpoints, there's nothing to tell you you're going in the right direction, or even if you're making progress. At least you'll always know if you've been through an area before, because unlike the first game, Rampage Edition actually lets you kill the enemies. That's right, no more putting the dinosaurs to sleep for a few paltry seconds with some worthless tranquilizer dart. You can shoot them full of lead or blast them away with a shotgun, blow them to bits with grenades and rockets, barbecue them with a flamethrower, or even atomize them with this extremely overclocked stun rod. Grant's had it up to here with the dinosaurs and their bullshit. It doesn't matter if you've got fangs and talons or a box full of grenades. If you are in his way, you are already extinct. I'm starting to think the rampage part of the title might not be referring to the dinosaurs. These weapons are so much fun. They have so much weight behind them whether you're fighting dinosaurs or the army of heavily armed in-gen scientists present on the island. Best of all, once you put enemies down, they don't get back up as long as you yourself stay alive. The levels can start out with so much visual noise from all that God damn it, not again! The levels can start out with so much visual noise that it's almost overwhelming but they don't stay that way. Here, the chaos does not continue. Kill enough enemies and the level will quiet down, which is a great way to tell you're retracing your steps instead of moving forward. Not that you really need to kill them. The raptors hit hard but otherwise Grant can tank a lot of damage, even from grenades. It's making me wonder what's actually in those first aid kits. There are a bunch of other pickups too but you don't really need to go looking for them. Human enemies drop enough ammunition that you'll never run out if you make an effort to clear the levels, and there are tons of boxes everywhere that either contain health and ammo or explode when you shoot them. Huh. That sounds kind of familiar. As for the point bonuses, I don't think they really impact the game at all other than your final score. I never went out of my way to collect them, and I finished the game just fine. The only other big addition to the gameplay is the fact you can ride several of the dinosaurs. It only comes into play in two levels as far as I could tell, the plains and the ancient ruins. The plains is spent almost entirely riding a Gallimimus trying to outrun InGen's fleet of helicopters. Huh. That kind of sounds familiar too. The Gallimimus is the only new addition to the roster from the original Genesis game, but it comes at the cost of the Brachiosaurs. No great loss, honestly. It's very fast and very satisfying to ride, but it's not very complex. You hold right, and sometimes you have to jump, and sometimes you hit a fence and fall off. That's pretty much it. You do even less on the Triceratops. Once you're on its back, it'll charge right until it doesn't. You can't make it jump. You can't make it attack, and even if you could, there are no enemies for them to gore. It's a mechanic that overall just feels unfinished, but it does add some variety and a little bit of speed to a couple of the levels. Otherwise, the game plays pretty much the same as the original Genesis game did. Grant has the same range of movement, though it is much tighter, and he doesn't die from a short fall at low health anymore either. He even looks better, like he actually belongs in the environment this time around. And he's not the only one. All the enemies got visual and mechanical upgrades too. The compies look completely different with their big cartoony eyes, and the way they spin and disintegrate when you hit them is just hilarious. The Dilophosaurs are now permitted to move, but only if they hop. It's still illegal for them to walk, and if one were ever to skip it would be on thin fucking ice. The T-Rex can move too, and it isn't spammed randomly about the various missions, but saved for the final confrontation of Grant's campaign, which actually gave her appearance some gravitas. The human enemies, strangely enough, are mostly unchanged, but there is a greater variety of them. They can still attack you from off screen, but Grant can do the same back to them, which makes dealing with out of sight obstacles much, much easier. 
Ironically, it's getting right up close to the enemies that makes it hard for Grant to hit them. The biggest upgrade went to the raptors. They're faster, they're meaner, they can use their tails as whips, and they can even spin attack like Samus for some reason. The only change I really don't like about them is that they make noises traditionally belonging to the T-Rex, and that's just not very film accurate, is it? They are much more interesting to fight though, and the new roster of moves carries over to the Raptors campaign too, which makes it much more interesting to play as well, at least in theory. The Raptor does have a greater number of moves, but some of them require pressing buttons like you're trying to perform a combo in a fighting game, and I'm just not very good at that sort of thing. I basically got through the campaign by jumping on everything since the Raptor's jumps do contact damage, but I will admit it was fun to throw one of InGen's goons off a platform with a whip of my tail, or a kick from my claws when I accidentally managed to put in the right input. The controls were at least tighter, they weren't anywhere near as floaty here as they were before, but they were also less consistent. I don't know if I was just hitting the buttons wrong, or if certain jumps required momentum, but there were some points where I just could not get the raptor to double jump when I wanted. I'm not even sure how I made some of these jumps. Much like Mr. Go Fuck Yourself at the end of the first game, I just kept trying until it worked. Watching it back, I'm still not sure what I did to get the raptor up there. The raptor's campaign here is better than the original games, but it's still just a rehash of Grant's levels. Once again, the raptor has no unique missions. There is no part of the game you will see as the raptor that you won't see as Grant, aside from this short frozen part of the ship. There's an attempt to mix up the mission order, but they're all ostensibly the same levels still. Made worse even by the fact you have no ranged defensive options as the Raptor. You ever tried spin jumping a helicopter to death? The lack of ranged attacks for the Raptor and my fumbling of the controls made her campaign the more difficult of the two overall. I tended to die at least a handful of times per level compared to the straight runs I often had with Grant, but it wasn't really a problem until the Raptor's final mission, the ship. The game had no reservations about spamming enemies up on hard to reach platforms, nor raining hell on you from above with homing fireballs from environmental hazards. Much more frustrating were the handful of switched up level routes. I do appreciate the attempt to differentiate how some of the missions play between the campaigns. For example, you start at the top of the aviary as Grant and have to make your way to the bottom, but as the Raptor you start at the bottom, make your way to the top, and then climb down another section of the map to end the mission. The river rapids are now covered in pipes to stand on since the Raptor still can't swim, although the Triceratops apparently can, and the interior of the ship is almost completely different from a certain point on. There are still a couple of levels that are identical, the plains and the ancient ruins are basically the same in both campaigns, and for that reason they were the easiest to navigate. The other three were an absolute nightmare sometimes though, because I just couldn't figure out where to go. I knew the layouts of each level from having played through them as grand, but the game gave no indication of how to complete them as the raptor. Getting up the aviary and into the ship were fairly straightforward, if frustrating, endeavours. But what to do once I'd achieved those goals was very poorly communicated by the game. And by poorly I mean not at all. I actually had to look up speedruns of where to go because by then I was just so frustrated by the controls and lack of direction that I just wanted the game to be over. It's not like there's some kind of marker to tell you you're going the right way, or a section that was accessible to Grand that's now blocked off to the Raptor. You are just dumped in these environments and expected to to figure them out. There's this bit of ship machinery you have to shoot as Grant that I thought wouldn't apply to the Raptor since you have no ranged attacks. But no, you're meant to leap up and break it. Same as these rage spiral inducing jumps in the aviary. The Raptor campaign of the original game may have been shit, but aside from one moment I always knew where I was meant to be going. Here I spent most of my time lost, just trying to figure out which part of the maze-like map the game actually wanted me to get to. And when I did get to them, the level ends were usually so abrupt it was like getting slapped in the face. You might think then that I preferred the levels that were exactly the same for both campaigns, but no, those levels were just boring. More thought and effort clearly went into the Raptor campaign in Rampage Edition than in the original game, but it still feels undercooked. It doesn't even build up to its final confrontation like Grant's campaign does. The two campaigns do have separate final bosses this time, which is a nice touch, but both of them are pretty lame. Grant's confrontation with the T-Rex is spent occasionally turning back to shoot it as you putter over to the right of the screen. It's more or less the same fight with the Rex as in The Chaos Continues, but, you know, not shit. And the Raptor's final battle is against this inexplicably red copy of itself. Mechanically, I understand why it's red, so you always know which one is you and which one is the boss, but thematically it makes no sense. Is it covered in blood? Did it fall in a vat of red dye? Is it a male and therefore more colourful? No idea. And the game makes no attempt to explain itself. 
I'd like to think this is the raptor you played as in the original game, because the idea of that thing being dead is, uh, very satisfying to me. And it would make narrative sense, since it's a direct sequel. Maybe it's just a reference to Robert Backer's book Raptor Red, which at the time of this game's release in 1994 had not actually been written. I don't know. Narrative implications aside, the fight is pretty terrible. All you need to do is spin jump in place dealing contact damage to it until it's dead, and that's all the Red Raptor does to you as well. It doesn't have a health bar, there's no way for you to know if you're actually hitting it or not. You just have to keep trying until it drops dead, or you drop dead instead. You would be evenly matched, if not for your own secret weapon, a Lysine High. The Raptor campaign may not feature ranged attacks, but it does feature these boxes filled with Lysine. In the books and the early films, one of the contingency plans built into the animals by Dr. Wu and his team of geneticists was a lysine deficiency, basically forcing a very strict lysine-rich diet onto the dinosaurs as a means of ensuring they would quickly die off if they ever escaped the confines of the park. I'm fairly certain the science behind that plot point is a crock of shit, but it's a moot point anyway since the dinosaurs inevitably find a way around the problem. Though I don't think the film or the book ever envisioned InGen just leaving boxes of lysine lying around the park for the dinosaurs to find. In Grant's campaign these boxes invariably explode, but they do provide extra points. In the Raptors campaign they're a power-up. Consume enough of them, box and all, and the bar in the top left will eventually fill up and you will enter Rampage mode. In this mode you become faster, stronger, and invincible. It doesn't last very long, and it turns the screen red, and overall throughout the game I never found it very useful, until this final boss. The game pushes you toward using it here too. The last couple of hallways before the boss arena in the ship's hold are filled with enough of these lysine deposits to fill the bar, even if you haven't touched one at any other point in the level. You need to be quick about it, but with Rampage mode on your side you can spin jump the enemy raptor to death without taking so much as a scratch. After that the game is over. There are separate ending screens for both campaigns, but they are both just variations on the same image. In fact you can see the Ghost of Grant's ending screen in the raptors. It's not even that different from the one you get in the Chaos Continues either. Like everything in this game, it just feels half-baked. It looks good at least. The visuals are a huge improvement over the original game. It's not visual mud anymore, mostly. You can tell what everything is at a glance, and there's an abundance of colour that really makes the backgrounds pop. It looks great, but it doesn't look like Jurassic Park, and it doesn't feel like it either, in just the same ways The Chaos Continues didn't. I had a lot of problems with the original Genesis game, and one of them was that it did very little to actually depict the park, but it did include the visitor's center and the maintenance shed, and both opening cutscenes featured appearances of park enclosures, brief though they were. This game feels even more disconnected from the source material than that, which is ironic because Rampage Edition seems to be the only game to actually include one of the park's amusement rides, the now dinosaur infested Raptor Rapids, but otherwise the game doesn't have anything to connect it to the source material aside from the aviary. And that level's not evoking something from the film, it's just adapting a set piece from the book. Same as the ship, which is just a ship, or the encounter with the T-Rex. The aforementioned Rapids ride is nothing more than a sign at the start and end of the level. The closest the game comes to adapting anything from the film is the planes level. Take Grant's hat away and you'd have even less connection to it. This is what I mean when I say the two games feel like the missing half of the other. Combined, the two games would complement each other well. Combined, the few film locations of the original game would bring the more interesting set pieces of Rampage Edition into context. A ship is a ship is a ship, but a ship in the same game as the park's visitor's center is clearly adapting that aspect of the book, as it was in the SNES version. On its own, it just doesn't feel connected to anything. I said about the original game, and the chaos continues, that if you took what few connective art aspects sets there are out, and renamed it Dino Attack, you'd never be able to tell it was originally a Jurassic Park game. And that's even truer here. Take the level built around ancient pre-Columbian ruins. The dinosaur-infested crumbling ruin is an old trope, but it's not one that feels at home in Jurassic Park. The whole style of Jurassic Park is these ancient creatures juxtaposed with, for the time, state-of-the-art computer systems housed in present-day buildings and research complexes. Having an ancient haunted temple doesn't just bend the suspension of disbelief, it also plays into old imperialist cliches regarding Central America that Jurassic Park has otherwise avoided. I'm not saying it couldn't work. It might even be an interesting comparison to depict these ancient halls of a long gone empire beside the newly built structures that InGen will in turn have to abandon to the jungle too. But it doesn't, and the strange supernatural aspect of the level just feels even more out of step with what Jurassic Park is. Unless of course this whole mission is 
is a fabrication on InGen's part, another theme park attraction to visit while holidaying in Jurassic Park, but I don't think it is. You'd think if it were, at some point the level would let you glance behind the curtain, and it never does. I'm pretty sure it's playing the trope completely straight, and it just doesn't fit the tone. It also doesn't help that both campaigns are now swarming with human enemies. It made sense for the raptor campaign, but Grant's just a paleontologist. I don't know how many times I can make this point. He barely knew how to use a gun in the movie, and preferred fighting raptors with poisoned eggs in the book. I don't see him going around skeletonizing every living being that dares exist on the same island as him with the most powerful cattle prod ever produced. I mentioned how in magazine articles the developers at Ocean Software said the filmmakers didn't want the video game adaptations to turn into straight up shooters, and you know what? I'm starting to see where they're coming from. Having human enemies for Grant to fight completely changes the tone of the game. Using these really powerful weapons against the dinosaurs feels appropriate, not just here but across all the games I've looked at, because characters in the book, and to a lesser extent the film, also use them too. Using them against other humans just feels weird, especially given it's InGen and not Biosyn that you're fighting. After all, InGen are meant to be the good guys, at least in the first film. The chaos continues also through an army of human enemies at Grant, but the Grant of that game made no effort to evoke Sam Neill's portrayal of the character, and it was much easier to accept as a result. Here, this is obviously Grant as he was depicted in the film, so it's much harder to reconcile tonally, at least in my mind. Speaking of The Chaos Continues, Rampage Edition in many ways feels like the exact same game. Like both Ocean and Blue Sky were given the same design document and told to make something of it, they hit so many of the same notes in much the same order. They both have level select mechanics. They both end with a fight against the T-Rex where you move right and occasionally turn back to shoot. They both feature levels set in the fields of the Gallimimus paddock where you are attacked by enemy helicopters. Hell, both of them have Grant fighting off invading armies of enemy scientists. The biggest difference between them is that the Chaos Continues have you fighting Biosyn, while Rampage Edition frames InGen as the villains. I almost wonder if it was meant to be Biosyn originally, but then Blue Sky Soft saw Ocean Software using them for the Chaos Continues and decided to go with InGen instead for Rampage Edition. It's honestly hard to separate this game from the Chaos Continues, though I'd say Rampage Edition is probably the better of the two, even if that does kind of come down to comparing two turds. The Chaos Continues felt like a direct copy of the Genesis game, with a few extra mechanics and many more levels thrown in, like Ocean Software was trying to stunt on Blue Sky. But there's nothing the Chaos Continues actually mechanically improved over the Genesis game, except maybe the weapons and the tighter controls. Rampage Edition actually did improve the formula, at least in terms of gameplay, and beat the Chaos Continues at a couple of its own levels too. But the game feels so unlike Jurassic Park, and introduced so many other issues that it's a Pyrrhic victory at best. Jurassic Park Rampage Edition is not the redemption I wanted for Blue Sky Soft. It's not the high note I'd have liked to have ended this retrospective on. It is not a good game. But it is at least playable, which is more than can be said for the last two games, though not in the way you might expect. I said at the start of this retrospective about 65 million years ago that this video only covers the first 12 Jurassic Park tie-in games out of the total 40 plus that have been made. And that's technically true, but I can't say very much about these last two because I haven't actually played them, though not for lack of trying. Jurassic Park Paint and Activity Center is one of the few games I've looked for and wasn't able to find anywhere online, legitimately or not. And I looked. You know things are desperate when you find yourself on the 10th page of Google search results. But from all I've seen and read of the game, it seems like a very tonally discordant Mario Paint-esque title questionably aimed at young kids. On the back of the box it says that every mark you make on the canvas comes with its own wacky sound effect. So you know what, I'm not actually too upset I skipped this one. Would I like to tear it to pieces? Absolutely. This sounds like a very cathartic slam dunk, a nice palette cleanser to lighten the mood right at the end of the video. Or maybe it's a competent colourful time waster that's actually worth a look. But alas, I haven't played it, and watching videos of it on YouTube isn't the same as experiencing the game myself. So unfortunately Jurassic Park Paint and Activity Center will just have to keep its secrets. As for the other game, Jurassic Park The Ride Online Adventure, well, I was able to find a copy, but I was never able to get it working. It's a browser game from 1996 that requires Java to run, and no self-respecting browser in 2022 allows Java applets to function. Thankfully, Internet Explorer has no self-respect, and neither do I apparently because I actually went back to that soggy dumpster of a browser to try and get this stupid game working. 
Yeah, you know things are bottom of the barrel desperate when you're hanging your hopes on the scuffed functionality of Internet Fucking Explorer. And it's true, it does allow JavaScripts to function, but I still couldn't get the game to work. I tried tinkering in the security options for ages, tried everything I could think of, it just would not work. Either the game is just too old, or Internet Explorer is just too shit. I couldn't get any other browser to run it either, even with Java enabling add-ons. I think the game is just too old. Although Internet Explorer is definitely shit. But it was only the playable part of the game that I couldn't get to run. The side content accessible from the main menu loaded just fine. Not only that, I was able to get my hands into the guts of the files and access pretty much everything else. I could peruse the art assets. I could listen to audio files. Help me. I could read the readmes and look at information on how to order a CD version of the game. I just couldn't play the game itself. Although I'm almost certain that I probably did back in the day. I don't remember doing so, but I was so obsessed with Jurassic Park back then that I can't imagine I didn't stumble onto this game and play the shit out of it, despite how terrible the internet was back then. From what I could glean from the files, it's a maze game where you have to escape a velociraptor by picking up objects and moving between rooms, but like I said, I didn't play it, so I can't be sure. I feel like Ed Harris in the first season of Westworld. The maze just wasn't meant for me. But maybe that's for the best. This isn't even a tie into the film. It's a tie into a real life theme park ride in Universal's Islands of Adventure, the Jurassic Park River Adventure. God, we've come full circle. Curious as I would be to give it a go, and happy as I would be to give it a short critique, I don't think we're missing out on much. This video's gone on long enough as it is anyway. Unfortunately, this is probably going to become more common going forward, unless I happen to find a random barcode scanner or VR headset lying around. But I think a close critique of 10 out of the 12 games ain't bad. If I do manage to find a way to play these games at some point, I will include them in future parts of this retrospective, for the sake of completion if nothing else. But for now, they'll just have to remain extinct. Which is honestly kind of a shame, because having a game tie into an actual theme park ride makes it the title with the closest connection to the actual theme park aspect of the entire series. When I originally envisioned this retrospective, I imagined doing all 40 plus however many it's a stupid number of games in one colossal video. From Jurassic Park for the Nintendo Entertainment System, to Jurassic World Evolutions 2. I'm glad I decided against that, not just because it gave me the option to talk about each game in a bit more detail, but because the games made to tie in specifically to the first film create a tightly connected group that going forward disappears. It genuinely feels like all these games were made from the same brief, as though the filmmakers wrote up a design document describing everything they wanted the games to include. Egg collecting, first person sections, river chases, exploding boxes. And the developers just picked and chose what they wanted and implemented them all in whatever way they could. It's an eclectic if weirdly constant set of ideas and mechanics. I know they're all adapting the same film, but it's still shocking how similar some of these games ended up, despite having different developers. Almost as shocking as how different some of these games ended up, despite being made by the same developers. I'm sure Ian Malcolm could find some way to relate how Ocean Software started in the same place for both the SNES and PC versions, and ended up with games of wildly different quality to Chaos Theory, but I'm not Ian Malcolm. Jurassic Park is a story about a lot of things. Corporate greed, the illusion of control, the complacency created by autumn systems, but it's also about the very old clashing with the very new in a way that its sequels really aren't, and that aspect of it the game's captured in spades. These games are torn between the ultra-difficult financially predatory shooters of the arcade era and the burgeoning world of first-person CD-based console titles. They are a fascinating mix of games that could not and would not be made at any other point in the medium's history. Some have mechanics that were so old they were middle-aged when the dinosaurs were still around. Others have mechanics that were so ahead of their time that some games today still don't get them right. Some of these games were good, some of them really weren't. Some of these games captured the magic of the source material, some of them really didn't. Some were campy fun, some treated themselves a bit more seriously, some actually felt like Jurassic Park, others were just riding in on the name, and some of them felt more like adaptations of the later films than adaptations of the first. For decades now I've had an idea of what my perfect Jurassic Park game would be in my head, and when I set out to make this retrospective many many months ago, what I was most curious to see was if any of the already existing titles could match that impossible dream. I was shocked to discover one of them almost did, but let's not kid ourselves. These games were hard, these games were cruel, these games were eggs, but they are also over. The lights are off, the doors are locked, the front gates are shut. We have finally escaped Jurassic Park. And that's it. 
The next part of this retrospective will cover the games released to tie into The Lost World and Jurassic Park 3, but it won't be the next video on this channel, because there's a few titles in there that I really want to do justice, and there's no way I could do another project of this size in a month or two. I probably wouldn't even expect it this year. Instead, the next video is going to cover a different movie tie-in game from the 1990s, one that is genuinely the worst game I've ever played. I'll see you then. Thanks for watching.